right? More than it's it and Japan is several times larger than than China, right? So it's that economic aspect I think which is very important. So now under Biden you have this made in America, right? Maybe maybe not make America great again, but at least make American products again, right? In America, yes. Yes. that's one thing. But the second thing is that there's also in recognition that the Obama engagement strategy uh, was not working as far as China is concerned. You know, they they essentially exploited engagement to push the envelope on the ground and there was not sufficient uh, pushback. The Obama administration's argument is that we wanted to play the long game. We had too, much, too many wars already. The last thing you want is to pick one with China, mm -hmm. but I'm gonna leave enough resources for the next administrations, which is exactly what's happening right now. Biden now has a lot of resources, right? Because Obama was able to pull back. He didn't get into war back in the days. He tried to resolve the issues with the Iranians, among others. And then now Biden is also taking America out of Afghanistan. So that may give finally Americans, not, not alone, unilaterally to push back against China. But if Americans can work with their allies, they can perhaps corral sufficient resources to what I call constrain China. Because I think the misunderstanding here is that you can contain China, like how we contained the Soviet Union during the Cold War period. But China is so integral to the global economy. It's so big and it's so relevant and dynamic that it just doesn't work, right? It's impossible. Uh, and it's not going to work also diplomatically because barely any, I don't think even the Japanese want a kind of containment strategy against China because they're so interdependent with the Chinese economy and mm. more and more so every year. Um, but I think constrainment to constrain mm. China through diplomatic, economic, and military countermeasures, that's very doable. And well, I think did this you is refer to Biden sorry. is improving on Trump. Yeah. Did you refer to it in your book as well as containment? Cons well, <laughs> Congagement. <laughs> Thank Con you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's right. No, that, that's, that's another variation true, on the I theme. I think a lot of uh, right wing uh, think tanks in DS DC were using congate. Uh, con I mean, like, uh, you know, like containment and engagement going hand in hand. Simultaneously. But I yeah. think, uh, you know, the better way to look at it is really constrainment. You know, we, mm. we can only constrain China. There, that's the best we can do because you, know, you cannot contain China. I mean, let's not kid ourselves here. But uh, you can constrain China. And my fundamental contention is China is still a rational actor. Xi Jinping may sound like all over the place to a lot of people, but I think he's still... Uh, I, you know, my understanding of Xi Jinping was this. He, he's kind of the opposite of Shinzo Abe. Like Shinzo Abe was using domestic reforms to push for a new Japanese role in the world, right? So I think all of his domestic reforms were kind of like a, just to give him a kind of a fuel edge, right? To, 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 for him to launch a new Japan, which is more relevant in the region geopolitically and economically, which he quite successfully has done, uh, at least compared to what, where Japan was 10 years ago. I think with Xi Jinping, it was the opposite. Right. He wanted to do some tough posturing outside, especially in the South China Sea on Taiwan, so that he has sufficient political capital to do major structural reforms in China. And I think he has been quite successful. I think, you know, everyone was expecting China's economy to slow down. It's not slowing down. And one reason is digital revolution. Right. Everyone thought that his corruption crackdown will create big backlash. It didn't happen. He further consolidated power. Now, Obviously, China will have problems down the road. They just kick the can down the road. There will be big issues with demographic decline, with environmental issues, with succession issues. We don't know who's going to. But in the meantime, I think Xi Jinping gamble work. Look tough abroad, get support at home, rise up popular nationalism, smash domestic e uh, uh, enemies, go with structural reforms, create a digital economy, move to the next stage of development. So far, he ticked all of that. He has done a good job. Mm. But I think Xi Jinping is quite smart to realize you cannot keep on doing. You have to once again reinvent your strategy. And this is something I really appreciate about Chinese statecraft. It's relatively dynamic compared to other countries, right? Mm. Other major powers, right? So I think Xi Jinping now realizes maybe we have to tone down the wolf warrior diplomacy, right? We didn't see that in the G20 summit. The Chinese were not doing the same shenanigans they were doing back in Alaska or some of the lower level guys in foreign ministry. They, Shinani. They're, they're kind of pulling that back. And if you look at the Boa Forum speech of Xi Jinping earlier this year, if you look at uh, you know speech at World Economic Forum, I think he's kind of raising the, uh, the, the, the white flag to, to Biden. But at the same time, of course, you know, he still has his guns there just in case Biden doesn't, doesn't welcome it. And Biden has not welcomed it. So he's hedging. But I think the effort is there. And to give you just concrete examples that China is, can be swayed, no? Uh, is, uh, that suasion works, strategic suasion works, is, for instance, 
Back in 10, 2010, 2011, 2012, everyone's saying, oh, China is going to build an Asian infrastructure investment bank. This is going to compete with World Bank. China will have full veto power. Guess what? Eventually, China for, uh, it decided to forego full veto powers in order to get the Europeans involved. So when Britain joined, the Germans, everyone came in. But you know that was not a total sellout because it also won concessions for the world. And AIB eventually became a much more transparent vehicle for uh, raising infrastructure capital. As far as the Belt and Road Initiative is concerned, yes, there was an element of debt trap diplomacy for weaker, uh, smaller countries, whether it's Laos, whether it's, uh, let's say, Tajikistan, uh, or, or some of the countries in Africa and Latin America. Uh, but it was not like a global debt trap diplomacy strategy because it, it's just not going to work in bigger economies or more transparent societies. But nonetheless, after Prime Minister Mahathir of Malaysia, really raised the issue and made the debt trap diplomacy a, a, cent, a central issue in global discussion, right? I mean, this is Mahathir, the number one Western basher now saying, we mm -hmm. fear new colonialism inside people's hall in China. I mean, how in your face can you get, I love that guy, you know? Yes. Uh, yeah, I am no fan. I told <laughs> him first, like when I was a kid, I, you were kind of dictator, weren't you? He was like, no, I was always there. But I, mean, I, I like he, how he switched in a good way, adjusting to the times, even if he's like, what, 95, six year old. Right? Yes, he's a but veteran. But after that, we see in the second Belt and Road Initiative Forum, uh, mm -hmm. Xi Jinping coming out and explicitly saying, we now need to make BRI more sustainable, right? Fiscally mm -hmm. sustainable, debt sustainability, I think is the term he used. Environmental sustainability is the term he used. Again, of course, there's a gap between rhetoric and action, but at least there is an open recognition that the BRI first version doesn't work. We need to move towards BRI 2.0. And again, U.S. alone cannot match China in terms of new infrastructure investments because, well, first of all, U.S. is a capitalist system. You know, White House cannot order Ford and Tesla to invest in country X and Y. Guess what? China can do that because it's not mm -hmm. really a capitalist system, yes. right? Yes, it, it, it's I agree. State-controlled mean uh, pseudo-capitalism, right? I mean, if they don't like what Jack Ma is doing. You know, yeah. we saw what happened, right? We saw I, what they're doing to, to Didi. We're, I mean, this is not, it's so when people say, oh, Chinese companies, these are private companies. Like, what are you talking about? Do you know what's going on <laughs> in China, right? They mm. have a national intelligence law that can compel mm. individuals to provide intel if it's necessary. Just read it. My God, don't be so lazy. I hate it when I hear it from officials in some Southeast Asian, oh, these are Chinese companies, not government, blah, blah. But anyways, <laughs> you cannot match them on a dollar to dollar basis, but if you can corral the Japanese, who, by the way, have more new pledges of investment in Southeast Asia, more than 300 billion, by the way, far more than China in places like Philippines and Vietnam. Again, everyone says, oh, China is taking over. No, it's not. I mean, show me a single Chinese big ticket infrastructure project in the Philippines. None, none. Mm. All of them got canceled right and left. Japanese, I can show you. You know, there's an underground metro they're going to build, so on and so forth, not to mention huge stock of investments from the past. You know, if you can bring in the Japanese, you can bring in the Europeans and, uh, and, and the Australians, among others, the, the, the cumulative effect of that is to put sufficient diplomatic pressure on the Chinese to make adjustments again, to make themselves competitive because the Chinese respond to competition. You know, in that sense, they're good capitalists. As, as someone said, was it Joseph Schumpeter, like the communists are, or socialists are the best capitalists, right? Um, they're really good in that. And I think that's where we can uh, get the ball rolling because yes, China is big, but if you combine Indonesia, in, uh, you know, India, Japan, all of these countries, if they can coordinate and they, of course, coordination is always hard, but if they can coordinate once in a while in certain issues, I think they can bear enough pressure on China. And the argument is better do it now while China is not yet the super number one. Yes. Because if you do this 10 to 20 years from now, maybe it's a bit too late. Right? Too late. So, Great. Time is everything. Time, timing is everything in geopolitics. So it is do it now. And that's why if you look at Biden's rhetoric, he keeps on saying, not on my watch, not mm. on my watch. It's all because about the he realizes timing. there's something with this presidency. I mean, Biden, sorry, I'm 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 overdoing this, but Biden okay. has a team of historians. He sees himself kind of like an FDR figure. Like he, he sees himself as someone who's at a very critical juncture in American history, in global history. And he my understanding, he'll run again <laughs> in, in three years' time. So, <laughs> so I don't know how old he's going to be. It's like, what, 40, 90, like whatever. Something but, like that. But he's going to, no, he's going to be 80 plus. Just He's still a young guy. I think oh. he'll be 82 or something. 82, he right. Yeah. He's going to run again. Almost yeah. certain he'll try his best to run. Whether he wins or not, let's see. But the point is he wants to use this four to eight years window 
to create enough pressure on China to set the tone for the next generation or two. Because if we wait more, if we do more Trumpian, like good intentions, but bad execution, or sometimes even bad uh, intentions, right? That's not gonna cut it. So night. So it's it. So if, if I'm gonna use a Hegelian term, it's a negation of negation. It's a negation of both Obama, a kind of just engagement, not much deterrence, but also a negation of the negation of the that, which is like Trumpian. Anything that's Obama is bad. Let's just go all the way in. Mm. Cold War. It that doesn't work too. So I think we have a very much optimal synthesis under Biden so far. Okay. You no, know, as far as overall in the Pacific strategy is concerned. Fantastic. Richard, I think there are three main takeaways that all sort of interlap very nicely together from what you've just shared with us. So the first is, if we look at the Indo-Pacific, I think what it teaches us in terms of countries trying to either totally placate China or totally resist or confront China, seems that often perhaps the most effective way is some sort of a middle ground where countries don't really reveal the total Mm, their total plan, but they do on some points, for example, what you just brought up with uh, Mahadi Mohammed, Malaysia's former prime minister, how he was supportive and welcoming of China's BRI, but then totally did a about turn and said, nope, this is too expensive. You need to cut the price. And they came to the negotiating table. I've seen you elsewhere praise Jokowi, uh, Indonesia's president, for the same sort of nuanced right. middle right. approach. If we look elsewhere in the region, we see, for example, the Philippines, where Duterte has become essentially a Chinese lackey and has totally given away everything strategically to Beijing and gotten nothing in return. We also look at Australia, where we see a very firm, uh, tough position, and right. yet, well, which is Australian, quite recent. Which this is was quite, not the case three years ago. This was not. There, the this case. was yeah. not, and yeah. we can debate whether or not that was a necessary. Yeah. Uh, change in posture yet it probably was but it's interesting how how well beijing uh has australia at you know top of its its economic hit list despite the fact that australia has still managed to increase its exports to to china but that's basically because china cannot get iron ore somewhere at, at that quality yeah, anywhere yeah. else so there's a couple exactly. of australia might be a slight exception there but generally were it not for china's dependence on australia on core mineral resources from Australia, right. Australia would be completely kind of pushed out of China's economic orbit, and that would hurt it inc incredibly in terms of its economy. So we could generally say that perhaps this kind of middle approach is the best way for, as you put it, mm, getting China to a more, to compete and actually bring a fairer deal to the countries of the Indo-Pacific and try to actually compete on the same level as say, uh, especially Japan, but perhaps also European actors as well. So I think that's one sort of nugget we got there. A second one would seem to be this uh, idea about, well, as you put it there with Biden and this sort of historic moment that we're in, it seems to me that Biden's approach uh, the negation of the negation, as you referred to it, is more like competition with China. Like he's actually trying yeah. to engage, not engage China. So, so, so as uh, sorry, engage his traditional allies and actually come up with alternatives based on you know democratic principles to China. So that's why we see this whole build back better for the globe and all of this stuff. Whether or not that's going to work, but at least the attempt is okay. We're going right. to compete with them in this game. Whereas the Trumpian model was more like, we're going to confront them and we're going to try to push back. And I think Pompeo is behind Trump's model, right? Basically as secretary of state uh, during that time. Now he well could be the next Republican candidate. So 2024, will Biden get a second term or could Pompeo be in the White House? We then could see again, this resumption of competition with China as opposed to uh, sorry, confrontation against China as opposed to competition right. with China. But it seems from what our discussion sort of hints at is that for the Indo-Pacific, it's actually better to have competition with China because then China becomes a fairer player in this in this game. And uh, the US strengthens itself as well and its allies strengthen itself as well because it actually has to do a bit of self-reflection to think about how can it actually uh, offer something better. And so I think I think those are kind of the, the bigger takeaways. But it seems to me that this may actually be a boon for in the Indo-Pacific region, but especially Southeast Asia, where mm. uh, there is so much need for development uh, across the board, which I then now want to bring us to the Philippines, 
Richard, because I think you've, you've definitely given us such a great macro perspective on, on all of this, but where exactly does the Philippines fit in the Indo-Pacific right now? Because to me, in your book, in your 2018 book, sorry, not, not the 2018 book, that's on Duterte, we'll come to that one later. The other book about, sorry, the, the Indo-Pacific, uh, Trump, uh, China, and, and the, the new uh, Indo-Pacific, we see there are so you lay out well three visions of the Indo Pacific. You've got Modi's, right. where India is a transcontinental pivot state, and right. you write, quote, the Indo Pacific is uh, this is a vision of shared by middle powers of shared order and collective prosperity, mm-hmm. which selectively congages China. Okay, and in this camp, we have m- mainly India, but also. Uh, to some degree, Australia and Japan. And then we have Indonesia's vision, the second one, which is the most non-aligned, you put it, and is very ASEAN-centric, and it recognizes China as a pillar of the emerging security architecture. So it's most accommodating of China, basically. Right. We then have the more muscular US-led vision, which is built around the US and its quad attempts, or you know, the, the, the quadrilateral efforts with Japan, India, and Australia to confront China directly. So where do you see the Philippines among these three visions, or does it have its own vision? Well, this is where things get very, very interesting. I mean, okay. I mean first of all, I mean, my uh, normative position is that you have to have a Goldilocks position, right? Not too hot confrontational a la Trump, not too cool and, and differential, or, or in, in that sense, uh, I would say hesitant and reluctant as we saw under Obama. And I think Biden is kind of getting that Goldilocks strategy moving forward. And whoever becomes the next American president, they will have to contend with the legacy of Biden, hopefully in a good way, right? So uh, path dependency, right? Whether it's in physics or whether it's in in social uh, context uh, is is a is something that matters. So Biden can set good patterns for his 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 uh, successors. I mean, the same way that you know Biden got some of the Trump ideas in dealing with China, they, the, even Republicans perhaps could could do the same with Biden, because as far as Biden is. You know, position is concerned, it's not too much too far from the central position of the Republican Party on China. He has big issues, differences on other issues, climate change, Middle East, so on and so forth. But but on that thing, I think there's some sort of a bipartisan consensus which may hold for a long time. And even within the Democratic Party, you see a lot of hawkish voices, Chuck Schumer, among others, uh, on, on China. I don't think these people will go away anytime soon. No, although let's see if Okasha Cortez can dislodge him from Senate. But but let's see. Um, so that's the thing. Now, going to the Philippines, I think the Philippines is, uh, I mean, again, if you look at countries across the region, it's really 50 shades of gray, right? Very few countries are openly against China, right? Uh, very few, probably, you know, I can count them with one hand. Um, and very few are also like completely satellites of China, right? Uh, so again, I can probably also count. I mean, what was interesting to me is that in North Korea, not even once did I hear them saying something positive about China. It was like fascinating. You could see that there was angst, right? You could see that they hated the fact that China made a mockery out of their Juche self-sufficiency doctrine. Like, how can you be Juche when like 90% of your trade comes from China, right? And Kim Jong-un is so pissed off, right? I mean, first of all, he killed his uncle, right? Who was the pro-China guy who wanted to create a mini China in North Korea. And then the and now he has sealed off the borders with China. I don't know what the situation is going to be. It's going to be even worse than uh, what we saw back in 2018 and 19. I'm quite worried about the situation on the ground. So Again, go to Pakistan, the supposed other ally of China. I mean, look at Imran Khan. He's begging the Saudis and Iranians and all to bail him out because they're too dependent on Chinese investments. And Chinese BR investments are not really doing well, right? I mean, you have the Baluchi insurgency against investments in Gwadar. Mm. Uh, you had even a bombing incident in Islamabad a few years ago. I mean, people are not paying attention to this stuff, right? Hello, like, it's not like Pakistan is a given. They love China. Much of it is out of desperation, right? If they have options, they will diversify. The same thing with North Korea. So that leaves you what? Cambodia? I mean, yeah. So, so that's my point. Like, who are China's allies? Who are China's? Well, allies? can I ask a tangential question? Do you think China really needs allies? I, I had another guest on the show a couple of weeks ago, Mohammed Zishan. We were talking about the exact this this exact mm. problem. Does it really need it? If it's is its strategy to gain influence and have other economies become dependent on its economy. Does it need ours? What's your opinion? That's China. I mean, look at the whole tributary system, right? Yeah. Uh, 
you know, the, the whole Tiangxi, right? You know, harmony under heaven. It's like xenocentric, right? That was the sure. whole point. You you balkanize the region, make him differential and dependent on you. I mean, that's the Chinese state statecraft BC, right? <laughs> like this is thousands of years in the making. I, I doubt sure. the Chinese want to get rid of that. It's just that they can't, they can't get the if they would. If they can, I think they would love to. It's just they can't, right? So for you mean them, if, if oh, they could, they enough. would love to have allies. That's, yeah, exactly. that's what you mean. Satellites, let's just call it that way. Just uh -huh. the way that Soviets wanted it. But of sure. course, they don't want it to do it the Soviet way, which is to put military troops there and bankrupt yourself, propping them up. The Chinese are smarter than the Soviets in that sense. But if they can, they would love to have a satellite. They just want to do it the cheap way. Just co up the top leaders and then the rest will follow. Well, that may work in Cambodia, but not in the Philippines, right? Which goes to our discussion. Now, that also matters because U.S. power in the region is a networked power. It was never just U.S. versus China. It was U.S., all its bases across the region. And yes, yes, of course, there's no... Um, illusion that U.S. allies are 100% reliable. Of course not. But even if Japan is 40% reliable, even if Australia were 20% reliable, cumulative effect of all of these partially reliable allies, mm. Mm. you put that all together, then you can see the power of America in the yeah. region. That's why yeah. the staying power of America cannot be underestimated. So there are all of these fools who say, oh, but you think Japan will blah, blah, blah. Or That's not the point. No one has 100% reliable ally. That's just not how the world works. But if you have 10 allies, pretty huge countries, even if they're just 50% reliable when put them all together, and the, the other side, you have what? North Korea, Pakistan, and Cambodia with China. I'm not sure the balance of power is really that much against US as a network hegemonic power. Yes, because everyone looks at gross indicators, US GDP versus China's GDP. That's dumb. It's not how you look at power. It doesn't mm. I mean, You don't need to read Foucault to understand power. Just... Just, just, you just look at objective indicators. You cannot look at just gross economic output alone. You have to look at network of alliances. You look at, you look, you have to look at edge, qualitative edge in next generation military technology. Yes, the Chinese are catching up, but so are the Japanese developing fifth generation. So are the Ch uh, Korean developing, right? So even though some of these countries are, you know, more towards engagement with China than the others, at the end of the day, there's a U.S. ally and. My hunch is if it gets ugly and push comes to shove, if you go back to First World War, Second World War, you can pull in allies. If it really gets ugly, I don't think the Koreans thing can just play it safe. I mean, they have their U.S. bases there, right? They will be targeted by, 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 by China, right? It's not like the Koreans can say we're neutral. It just doesn't work. If things get ugly, it doesn't work. And by the way, let's not forget, this is all a game of deterrence. The more networks of bases and allies you have, you will dissuade the other side from even challenging you. That's the game here. No one wants war. This is the thing. But we can sleepwalk into war if we don't play our cards well. And, and that's why you have to have a Goldilocks strategy. Now, going to the Philippines, the Philippines is exactly caught across all those three lines. So Duterte and some of his minions are obviously sounding more like Hun Sen and probably have already got the golden medal for loyalty in, in Southeast Asian region, right? As far as China is concerned. But that's not the position of the defense secretary, of the military establishment, of the foreign secretary, of bureaucrats, mm -hmm. of the media, of the public. And, you know, Duterte, yes, I think he has a lot of, um, he is an imperial president, if I, I may use that American term, in terms of setting domestic politics, right? It's drug war, among others. But foreign policy, I, my contention from day one was he never has unilateral power. He has to contend with other veto players. The Chinese Filipino business community, uh, the military establishment, which is uh, close to U.S., trained by the U.S., and, and that has always hampered Duterte's ability to, to pivot fully to China. That's why the Philippines actually has a dual foreign policy. It depends on who you listen to. And of course, that has created a lot of uncertainty, both for US and both for, for, for China, uh, in both good and bad ways. My point is, it's good to play good cop, bad cop if you're doing it in a coherent and smart way. But if you're good cop, bad cop, because there's really a complete disintegration of your, your decision-making process, that's not good for the Philippines. So as a result, the Philippines is not getting anything either from China or US, right? Mm. We're yet to get the advanced armaments from Americans that we have been asking for. We're yet to get a single big ticket infrastructure investment from China. So, you know, you can play. So, you know, Duterte's art of the deal was kind of promising in 2016, all the way up to early 2017. And you can see that in my earlier writings, right? Which a lot of people misunderstood as me being a pro-Duterte guy or his unofficial spokesman, right? 
But, you know, as Kane said, you know, when facts change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? Right. And so I, I observed the facts on the ground and it's like, this is not looking like equilateral balancing anymore. This is look, this looks like fragmented decision making. This looks like sloppy pivoting to China. This looks like mindless fighting with allies. I'm not happy about that, you know. And in light of that, in 2019, I did a black blank column protest against Duterte, right? Title Duterte's independent foreign policy, and then blank, right? Which got me a lot of trolling, among other things. But you know, so, so that's why a lot of people don't understand because you know, not many bother to read probably what 1,000 articles and book and everything throughout the years. But that's how obsessively I've been writing the first draft of history of Philippine foreign policy under Duterte, among others, over the past years, obsessively looking at every single change, minute changes. And what I can say is that the Philippines is, is an unfortunate case of failed uh, foreign policy diversification. But, but should a centrist, quote unquote, centrist become the next president of the Philippines, I believe just like Biden, we can have a good negation of negation. Both a negation of the history of subservient American leaning American uh, Filipino presidents. Like, I mean, it was just shocking. The things I came across working in the government in the past. And it's like, it's like there, there's a presupposition, like as if Philippine and American interests in the region are, are similar or like they overlap. That's not the case. I mean, even the Japanese or Taiwanese or Koreans, like they never presuppose that American and their interests are more or less overlapping. No, I mean, they're allies. Sometimes it doesn't work and sometimes you have to pull and push, right? That was not really the, the case with former Filipino presidents, to, to right. be honest, with all due respect to them. No, a lot of them, some of them have been good friends and, and all. Um, with Duterte, I think he correctly recognized this is wrong. Except <laughs> His solution was even worse, I would say, because, you know, this is a guy who barely traveled like, outside the country. I don't know, Paul, mm. his passport was like two stamps in 10 years, you know, mm. or five years. For it. I, I don't think this guy, you know, he actually was quite a, like Xi Jinping. <laughs> he was the honchu, uh, you know, the, you know, Xi he Jinping was the big guy well. of, 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 you know, of, uh, of the vow. Sure, he, I think he was. He saw the raw, ugly side of the global war on terror, which explains why he hates Americans a lot. Mm. And, you know, I kind of understand him, like, you know, the stuff that the Americans were doing in Mindanao, you know. That felt like invasion to a lot of people. I, mean, I, I can sympathize with that. I'll, of, of course, I can understand where he's coming from. But once you're the president of the Philippines, it's a different ball game, right? So you had a mayor, a longtime mayor, a provincial mayor, catapulted into the middle of Indo-Pacific geopolitics overnight. What do you expect, right? Sure. I was hoping the smarter guys around, the wise guys, will prevail. But how can you prevail over a Trumpian guy like that? Good luck with that, right? So you cannot prevail, but you can push back. You can come. So the result mm. is this, this, this back and forth, back and forth, contradiction, contradiction, which I absolutely believe is not intended. This is not good cop, bad cop. This is a fragmented, dualistic foreign policy with suboptimal outcomes for the Philippines. But I'm not giving up hope. That's why I'm writing a lot and I'm talking to a lot of people because I hope the next president, even if it's Sara Duterte, no, uh, they will learn the lessons, the deficiencies of their father or, or the current president and work on it because I believe we can do it. And uh, just to end at this point, I'm really, really an, um, inspired by the, the quantum leap in terms of public consciousness on policy issues. Believe me, five, six years ago, who cares about South China if you talked about it, right? Like, mm. what is that, right? Okay, not six, sorry, seven years ago, I would say, like 2013, 14, barely anyone. I think I was among first persons in the Philippine, uh, Philippines going to media and talking about South China. It was so vague. Who cares? Now, you know, I have taxi drivers debating with me on UNCLOS. <laughs> United <laughs> Nations. I mean, it's amazing. I love it. I, I'm so encouraged by it. Again, of course, the quality of this garden is not quite there yet. But, I mean, the interest is there. Mm. Geopolitics is now sexy in the Philippines. And I cannot, you know, deny it. Duterte's shenanigans kind of made that possible. He contributed mm. to me. Because, you know, Duterte is just so randomly and trivially talks about geopolitics that it suddenly becomes relatable to everyone, whether yes. you hate him or not. Right. Yes. Like, yes. Like, can you imagine? I'll post something on geopolitics and it gets like 20,000 or 16,000 likes on social media. This was unthinkable. Probably celebrities posting some stupid stuff about their fashion could get that. But now you can get that in the Philippines. It's just mind boggling. Yeah. So, for me, we can get something good out of this, as bad as the situation or suboptimal. Mm. 
uh, my vision is long term. You know, mm. we, we want to look after our national interest in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years because I think that's the window before China locks it in. <laughs> sure. I admire I'm, your optimism, Richard. It's it's yeah. it's very encouraging. Oh, very cautious, very cautious optimism. Cautious I mean, optimism. Because, but I think it's I think it's very encouraging. Mm. I've just got I mean, a couple of questions. Seeing to... what happened in other regions, like in the Middle sure. East, I think we are in a good position. So okay, yeah. I mean, well, maybe I mean, it's, yeah. it's a it's strategic gratitude, right? I mean, if you have <laughs> seen what's there in other regions, you will be happy with what, what we have. That's, that's... That's, that's, that's the perspective. Perspective is very, very important. Very, very yeah, important. and the experience Honestly. that informs that perspective. And, and <laughs> yeah, as exactly. your experience says, you say 10 years, it's not just a stopover in the Middle East. So we've got a couple of questions. To me, like, like I appreciate you sharing uh, what it's like on the ground there in Manila, because it seems that this uh, unbundling or falling apart of the Duterte diplomatic strategy has been, you know, years in the making, or, you know, we could already see its failures coming uh, back in time. But I think for the international community, it seems, although everyone was quite suspect of, of Duterte, obviously, it seems that the jury was still out on whether or not it could actually eventually work for the Philippines in terms of hedging uh, between the US and China. But I think the, at least the, the point for me where it all sort of fell apart, and I think it was quite obvious, it was a very public uh, kind of embarrassment, was the Whitsun Reef standoff this year. I think that's where you know the, the Philippines was really shown to be as vulnerable as it could be. You had all these Chinese quote unquote yeah. fish, fishing vessels there, oh. couldn't do anything about it. And then Duterte got very desperate and now he you know put a gag order on his cabinet minister. So then you couldn't hear for the international community couldn't hear the other side of what you're talking about yeah. there. This this pull and and push between Duterte and and the sort of uh, if I were to be cynical, the quote unquote deep state or, or we could just say the legacy the established uh, steady state. I think yeah. that's the that's the term that some <laughs> Some folks in Trump, I mean, we are the steady state, right? The like, state is state. We are the sure. counterpart to the madness of populist leaders. Right? That's right. Steady so, state, I'll call them that. Yeah, yeah, when we couldn't hear the state of state's voice after he sort of put that gag order. So I just got a quick question. Let's hope that the next uh, administration does learn from the mistakes of this administration. But what are the odds that it's going to be uh, Sarah Duterte? And what are the odds are that um, Rodrigo himself becomes the vice president? Because it We've heard the rumors that he's going to run for vice president. So, uh -huh. what, what, well, like, I mean, if you're a betting man, what are you going to go back to my writings in what, 2018, 2019, I said, you know, it's not impossible that Sarah will run for the next president and or Bongo for that matter, which is, you know, because my, you know, that's it. My, my model is Medvedev Putin, right? In the late 2000s, right? When Putin kind of met a constitutional restriction, he put his minion in charge, right? Which is Medvedev. It got a little bit complicated, but eventually Putin had to, you know, reset the deck right and now it's fully in charge <laughs> back again right like i don't know what's happening reset with medvedev he's That's having good. a good lifestyle there mm. and getting yeah. exposed by navalny uh mm. but but the, the the thing is i saw that coming in many ways but that's your plan sure but this is the philippines my friend i mean manny pacquiao great friend of the president fellow mindanao boy is now now the most trolled guy in the philippines i mean i'm I'm looking online now and the things the pro Duterte people are saying against Pacquiao, you can't believe that. I mean, these are the stuff really? that, you know, you would imagine they'll say about opposition of the opposition. You know, they're going to his tax records. They're, I mean, it's oh. just crazy, man. It's crazy. I mean, wow. I, mean I, I was never a Manny fan in terms of politics. I mean, of course, as a Filipino, I love what he's doing. Although I'm not into boxing, it's really boring. I mean, I'm a UFC MMA guy. But, but I mean, all could do is, I mean, what? He has the record for the most championship. In, I think even Mayweather didn't beat that, right? I mean, Mayweather was undefeated, sure. But, but Pacquiao is one of the greatest of all time, right, in terms of boxing. I'm proud of that, you know, um, as a Filipino and all. That's great. But, you know, but it just shows that now Pacquiao is openly challenging Duterte, saying there's corruption under your, your, your and, and as I said, one of the great legacies of the late President Aquino was he made the corruption issue a central political discourse that even Duterte could not deny it. So, you know, Duterte, you can say anything about him, like you can say he's a Chinese puppet, or you can say he's, you know, he's doing this drug war and all of that. But if you say he's corrupt, oh, he's so sensitive about that. He's so sensitive about that. And when Pacquiao talked about corruption, that pissed off Duterte. He went rambling and saying, Pacquiao, you, you know nothing about politics. You know not. So now I'm seeing what's happening to Pacquiao. But Pacquiao is Pacquiao. You know, he's not going to He's not gonna move. go down without he's a fight. You know? <laughs> he's, the more you hit him, he's going to come back stronger. And if 
So maybe for the first time I'm gonna watch one of his boxing matches really with interest. Um, uh-huh. Sorry, not because of Pac. I really just don't like boxing. Watching um, boxing as a political commentator. Yeah, because <laughs> if he wins the match in August, oh my God, he will run. He will run. Mm. My man, go. I mean, there there are other stuff confidential, so I cannot share. But I know there are movements going on. And then mm. the other interesting are the Marcoses, like. Uh, Email the Marcos, by the way, I'm sure people know her. Email Diffic, all this. She's still alive. She's still around. I think she's a governor now. She was a congress. Um, she wants to get back to the Malacanang, the presidential palace, you know, before the sunset, right? Uh, and I think, you know, these elections, it, it, this that's is her it. chance. And Ferdinand Marcos Jr., right? He's 63, I think, already, a Wharton graduate. Uh, although I don't know how he graduated from Wharton because he never got his Oxford undergraduate, but never mind. Things happen, right? With business schools, I don't know. Uh, your dad is the dictator after all back in the. But anyways, that's a difference. But Boma Mark is saying, wait, 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 wait. I practically won the vice presidency, at least from his perspective. I just lost it by razor thin. I'm challenging that. Uh, naturally, I think I should run for the presidency right now, right? And he's he's bringing back the issue that he was cheated in the elections. He should have been the vice president. Why? Because you want to run for the president, right? So there was a gentle nod on the third. Just hello, hello, we are here, right? That's why I think I've been among the first guys who said, let's not forget this could also go down between House of Marcos and House of Duterte. Except yes. There are other players in the game. Manny Pacquiao may not win, but he could create a lot of wrinkles. You know, I mean, in the in, in the in the plan. Um, and the other one is this hugely charismatic figure, the Manila mayor, Mayor Isco Moreno. No, I mean he's he's he has this uh, you know he's an actor, he's a celebrity, mm, he has okay. this Hollywood looks. He's young, he's forty plus. He came from the slums. He came from the poorest of the oh. poor. Work his way up and then did executive courses from Harvard to Oxford. He plays his game so well. He does 2 a.m. shows cleaning up somewhere in Manila. You cannot match that. Even mm. the third that to say I praise this guy. He is formidable if he runs. He is very formidable. And then there's still other people like Graceful, uh, Senator Graceful, the daughter of a, a kind of like Sean Connor of the Philippines, who almost became a president. She she was the leading candidate in 2016 until everyone went against her and questioned her citizenship. But she effortlessly still tops the races in Senate. Wow. And now she's tied with Bongo Marcos for number two in the presidential race. And Sara Duterte is, is number one in the surveys, but sure. her numbers are half of that of the former uh, uh, anointed success or, or former runaway winner, which is the former vice president, Binay. Everyone thought he'd be the next president. His, his preferability were like 40 to 50% before mm. election. Mm. Guess what? He ended up number four in the elections, right? So early lead actually exposes you to uh, mm. to organize pushback, including by your so-called allies, right? So I think this is far from, uh, you know, this is uh, this is not a foregone conclusion. It's gonna be. Mm. Yes, I would bet that under emergency situation with all of Duterte's, you know, worries and everything like that, um, you could say that the stack, you know, is you could say that the, you know, the the, the way is uh, the scale is, um, is is in their favor, right? Sure, but uh, I think things get significantly changed in the coming months, and, and especially if the centuries can come out and do this and say, you know what, Duterte, if we become the president, don't worry, our priority will not be to put you in jail, right, or to send you to international criminal court. So you don't have to panic and do shenanigans to make us lose. Don't worry, we can do a, what Latin Americans call pacted transition, right, which is what they do with Pinochet. And then later on, we can take care of you, which is what happened with Pinochet, right? The centrists are always in a position to do that, right? And then the other thing the centrists can do is that, okay, people, don't worry. We're not also like the old opposition that you very much dislike. And we're, there's some stuff with Duterte we also like, compassionate, understanding. Well, again, this is just perception politics, right? And we will be decisive in ways that others were not. And we'll not be American lackeys, don't worry, but also not Chinese lackeys. So I think, mm. and third, Philippines is one of the worst hit countries in the region, not only in terms of infections rates, but also, but in terms of economics. 10% economic decline almost last year. I mean, this yes, is shocking. depression level. Mm. I mean, it's, I mean, I, you know, I was abroad for a while in the past year or so. I came back Philippines, it's like, it's kind of half goes down. I mean, Manila is a wild, wild place. You can feel it. People are not shopping. People are not going out. There's a lot of fear. Vaccination is so slow, everything like that. So, you know, there is a lot of, I would say, 
subcutaneous anger there, right? That could be easily tapped by any skillful politician without totally scaring Duterte, right? So that is a, also the Goldilocks, Goldilocks politics strategy that the centrists can take. That's why I'm saying, even though I was probably the first one who said this could go down between Duterte and Marcos, I'm, 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 I'm looking also at the possibility that actually the centrists, um, in theory, actually also have very good chances to win it. They, they just have to play their cards well. And if they team up, let's say Pacquiao and Isco Moreno or Graceful and Isco, that could be a formidable team. But mm. should Marcos and Duterte team up, then I think it's going to be really an uphill battle to beat them. That will be an almost unbeatable team. Should the Marcos and Duterte uh, join forces, mm. which again is not impossible too. But Philippine politics is so factious, right? Uh, fractious and 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 so uh, there, there are no real political parties. Nothing like what we have in Taiwan, right? Or in other countries that I've observed very closely. Um, so it's very personality driven. And when things are personality driven, the room for, for surprises is huge. And also Filipino people. I mean, I'm not orientalizing us. I mean, I would say we're, we're the Latinos of Asia. We're very emotional people. And the, the flow of emotions can radically change. I mean, just look at the Brazilian elections. I mean, Bolsonaro was a joke, right? And then the, he was stabbed. And then he did that Facebook Live, I think, from hospital and all. And then there was a shift in sentiments towards him. Bolsonaro was not a foregone populist winner in, in the elections in, in 2017, I think. Yeah. You know, so emotions will play a, a part. And that's just very interesting. To on this, just to yeah. end on this note, in the last uh, 30 plus years since the collapse of, of the Marcos dictatorship, probably only one president won who was expected to win, which is Joseph Estrada. And he barely lasted more than two years in office, right? Practically all other presidents were surprise winners. Not only Duterte, but also Aquino. His mm. mother dies in 20, 2019. He's catapulted the presidency with biggest margin of the votes, bigger even than Duterte. Ramos, I would say one of the smarter guys who became the president of the Philippines, he won with only 26% of the votes. Remember, Philippines only has single round first past the polls. Mm. All you need to do is just to win more votes than the others. So if many Duterte-esque figures run, who knows? That actually could even open the room for the opposition to win under Vice President Lenny Robredo. So there's something with the electoral design of the Philippines that makes it inherently far more unpredictable than all other elections uh, in, in comparable democracies. E That's very interesting. So that is why it, it, it's, it's a fool's errand to say it's a foregone conclusion. But, but yes, mm. of course, if you were to bet... You know who to bet on now. And I, I would say if, if it's a Marcus Duterte combo, whoa, that's that's going to be difficult. But just to bring it to geopolitics, that doesn't mean if it's Marcus and Duterte uh, for next year, um, it's going to be Cambodia, right? I don't think so. I, I, I don't think so. Because these are also astute politicians who are aware of domestic politics of the Philippines, of the military establishment and all of that. And by the way, you know, Duterte, with all of his unabashedness, all of his super pro china esness, right? He couldn't pull it off. He couldn't. I mean, mm. still exercises with America are continuing. Yes, the VFA is in the air, but not abrogated. You know, other agreements are there. So if Duterte could not pull it off, I doubt that his successors, even his anointed successors, could pull it off. Probably they'll mm. have to recalibrate considering how Duterte went over the board. So in that sense, again, I'm not, I'm saying the future is rosy, but I believe that the future is far more open, including the chance for progressive change, both on the domestic level in countries like the Philippines, but also on the geopolitical level in terms of constraining China's worst instincts. When is Netflix doing a series on Philippines political dynasties? I think that... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I I think there's <laughs> lots of stuff happening on Netflix. I mean, honestly, I'm, mm. I'm, I'm thinking of getting involved into uh, some of these productions and all. You should be a screenwriter if they do something. Yeah, I mean, for, we're, we're, I mean, for uh, last year I, I got this uh, proposal from Oxford University Press to do kind of an annotated bibliography of the hundred best works on Philippine politics. So I had to go back to the time of Rizal in the late 19th century, Goodness. Spanish colonial era. So it was like six months intensive work going through all classic works and then annotating them and everything like that. And that gave me a perspective of Philippine history. Like, wow, amazing how open history was. 
Like at one point, Philippines was the country, like the first country in Asia uh, to go against colonial power. The next one is yep. the most desperate country. Again, the next one is the second richest country. Then again, it's a sick man of Asia. Then it's a rising tiger. Then now it's like worst affected. It's really, it's just, unpredictable. I mean, you don't need uh, screenwriting. You just need to write just to history. watch the history, no. which I want to take deeper really? into the nature of, of Filipino democracy because you mentioned there that the emotions play such a large role and you likened Absolutely. it to, to Latin American democracies. And, you know, I think it's interesting then that we have this Facebook dimension because social media sure. is so great at uh, manipulating our emotions and the emotions of voters. And you've had firsthand yeah. experience of coming <laughs> sure. up against censorship or whatever you want to call it by Facebook in the Philippines. Uh, we all know the story of Maria Ressa, who's been very outspoken on the international arena and has won uh, United Nations awards for her work and everything. So she, her work and, and Rappler there have really done a great job in sort of right. bringing this issue to the, glo the attention of, of global audience. So I just sort of wonder on what level do you feel that, yeah, like social media in the Philippines democracy. And also you've also written about how the Philippines was Asia's oldest democracy, first democracy, yeah. which, uh, and then, as you mentioned, it's, but it's also not really very mature in terms of party politics. It's very personality driven. How do you reconcile these differences for yourself, Richard? Like, how do you feel about the fact that historically it's been the longest or oldest democracy in Asia? Mm -hmm. And yet it's at this point. And or is, is there another spin on this that we're not missing? And, and how does social media factor into that? Yeah, I mean. There are many factors, but I would say, first of all, Philippines is an, uh, as one author put it, an aborted nation. So it was emerging as an independent post-colonial country on its own terms. Mm. Uh, the Filipino revolutionaries, a lot of them trained in Europe, uh, in German schools, in Belgian schools, engineering schools. I mean, these were great warriors, right? I mean, they really gave it to the Spanish, right? The Spanish were really on their back foot. And then what the Spanish did was because they didn't want to lose the Filipinos, I mean, as racist as they were back in the days, they just sold it to the Americans, right? And then the Americans, they hoodwinked the Philippines back in the day. So, so that was the first tragedy of the country. The second tragedy was that democracy was given on a silver, silver platter to, to oligarchs in the Philippines in the 1920s and 30s. And that pattern, so it was not a democracy that was gained, right? And that, that was a problem. So uh, once the Philippines got its independence in the in the mid 1940s onwards, until the Marcos dictatorship, you had a freewheeling, oligo liberal oligarchic game, right? So each warlord running his own election game, guns, goons, and gold, right? That was the name. And then Marcos came and said, you know, like kind of like a big mafia boss, hey, come on, this is a joke. Let's streamline this process. Let's work it through me, right? I'll be the big boss. Except. He was a massive failure because he had 21 years in power to do what uh, Chiang Kai-shek's heirs did in Taiwan, uh, to mm. do what uh, you know, yeah. General yeah. Park did in Korea, to mm. do what Lee Kuan Yew did in Singapore, even Matir did in Malaysia. 21 years. Guess what? By, in 1982, the Philippine economy totally collapses amid the debt crisis. 1986, treasury is empty and the Philippines is left with $26 billion in debt. And guess what? Zero, zero Kias, Samsungs, all of those kinds of high-tech companies that Taiwan and Korea and all of these countries were able to build during their own authoritarian transition period, right? And a sad thing is that the Filipino middle class, doctors, professionals, a lot of them either went to the US in the 60s and 70s or 80s, including my relatives and uncles and everyone like that, or they were forced to work uh, in Middle East and other places as overseas workers. Again, all of this started under Marcos. I mean, it's amazing how many people forget this and praise Marcos. Oh, he built us roads and all as if it came from his own pocket. And for heaven's sake, he had 21 years in office. Even if he put an idiot in office for 21 years, probably would have built more airports or something like that. I don't know. But the fact of the matter is that was a golden opportunity for the Philippines to do institution building, right? Not be the Weimar Republic of Asia. Like, just like Weimar of Germany, we have had fantastic constitution, great lawyers and everything, but the, the institutions were rotten from within, right? And the Democrats mm -hmm. were always weak. They were not willing to stand up to the, uh, to the fa fascist elements. So under Marcus, we had the chance to consolidate the state building process, to build strong economy. It didn't happen. Then 
you know, 1986 people power revolution happens, essentially the old elite come back and then the Marxists eventually also come back, right? So you have a hodgepodge of that. So now we expect in six years for Benigno Aquino, for the late Aquino to solve a century old neglect and, and cluster mess. That's a joke. But even in that six years, I mean, as, as, as I said, he's the greatest transitional leader the Philippines had, what we, we should have had way earlier. The first att attempt, I think I was under Ramos. He did a very good job, 1992 to 1998, but Asian financial crisis happened. So sadly, uh, the Philippine gains were, were, uh, were, were un um, appended, and then we got the populist Estrada. I mean, pff, things collapsed, right? Then 10 years under Arroyo, mess, mess, mess. Then Aquino kind of fixed it, and then boom, now we have Duterte. Now, so, so if you have this, what the French historical school called long jury, not lingerie, long jury, long duration analysis, then you can see that there is a lot of room for improvement here. There's a lot of room. There's nothing predetermined. It's just so inherently uncertain and, and up in the air that, that, that it's shocking that almost 100 years since the introduction of elections, democratic elections in the Philippines, we're still in the blueprint stage, right? Mm. The good thing for that is that should we elect a good leader and that person proves decisive, then maybe we can really uh, really build a good blueprint in ways that probably the Americans cannot anymore. Like, you know, mm. what they have is too ingrained, right? Including their electoral college of system course. and all that, all yes. that stuff. Love At least it. we still are fresh in a weird way. Yeah, experimental. So, and honestly, in, in theory, I am... I am um, okay with the idea of constitutional change in the Philippines, but yeah. under very, very specified circumstances because there are some mm. friends of us who want new constitution, but how can you get a good constitutional change under bad person, right? Yes. Because they're going to game the system. So should we have a dependable uh, administration in the near future? I am willing to push for constitutional change, if not an entire new constitution per se, whereby among others, I hope Filipino presidents like Indonesia can run for two terms, mm, uh, perfect. probably two five-year terms, right? Because six years is too short, but it's also too long if you're a bad leader because you cannot impeach anyone in the Philippines. That's, that's almost impossible to get the enough votes. Trump, just like yes. US, right? Yes. Some of the bad things he got from Americans. And I think the just, just to end on this point, the, the, the tragedy of the Philippines is that it got you know, the two colonial powers that shape the country's state building patterns and, and nationhood for that matter is that, you know, it, it's Spain, which was not really known for state building and 19th century America, not, not FDR America, you know, late oh, 19th yes. century America was a libertarian America. And unfortunately that libertarian um, mindset is very alive among, uh, uh, among Filipinos up until today. Trust in government is very low in Philippine government, mm. in Philippine society. Trust in government doing social justice uh, uh, reforms is very low, uh, which is big contrast to a lot of our neighbors like Taiwan, Korea, Japan, where, where the state is a welfare state, uh, make sure that inequality levels don't go high. You know, that, doesn't, that, doesn't, uh, uh, that doesn't exist in the Philippines. And I would partly claim the libertarian legacy of 19th century America, which conquered the Philippines mm. uh, towards the ends of the Spanish colonial era in 1898. I think, I thank you for bringing up uh, Indonesia just at the moment, sort of preempts my next question quite sure. nicely. In then now making some comparisons to Latin America again, it's often said of Brazil that it is forever the country of tomorrow. Everyone's of potential, always, right? Potential, but just that, potential. But just yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and, <laughs> but... I often wonder in Southeast Asia, is that a true description of Indonesia or perhaps the Philippines? I've read yeah. some pieces of yours recently about Indonesia being the invisible state or invisible power and where it's going in the next few years. Like just keeping that Brazil framework in mind, which, yeah, yeah. or yeah, what do you think about that framework in regards to the Philippines? And Indonesia, the Philippines, of course, being the second largest country in Southeast Asia. Yeah, I mean, you just put Indonesia and Philippines together, that's like more than half of the region, right? I mean, people again forget. I mean, people don't eat our foods that much. I mean, like, you go everywhere in Southeast Asia, and it's like, you don't know, Cambodian food, Thai food. Like, like, Thai food, hey, yeah. You're yeah. forgetting Vietnamese more than half food, of yeah. the region Indonesian yeah. food and Filipino food. I mean, sure. I mean, Australia, there's a little bit more Indonesian food, maybe, uh, than the other bit, yeah, countries. Yeah. But you don't find it much in, in I don't know, New York or I mean in London or whatever, no. as much as you should, right? 
there is in Amsterdam or in, in uh, there is in, in Netherlands uh, for that matter for understandable region because there were the former colonial power. But yeah, I mean, uh, how should I put it? I mean, uh, the, for a long time, Brazil was also seen as the invisible superpower, right? Like it was always there, but yeah, I mean, we love their football and their jazz and all of that, but no one talks about their politics as much until quite recently, thanks to Lula and of course, Bolsonaro for the worst reasons, right? Um, and then, of course, we saw Brazil was taking off. And, you know, the economists had all of those, you know, images of, you know, mm -hmm. Brazil. And then it, it went bust, right? Because, you know, the, the fundamentals were just so weak, right? Uh, fundamentals of uh, accountability for, for the military uh, uh, era of abuses. So Bolsonaro could build on that autocrat nostalgia. And of course, Lula, there was also a limit to, to his social justice reforms, right? Which, which pissed off a lot of upper middle class and rich Brazilians, not to mention the newly middle class who suddenly turned against him. So that's the case. Uh, there are, um, of course, parallels with Philippines and Indonesia, the same way with India, I would say. There's a lot of parallels going on there. But, but you know, the advantage that Indonesia and Philippines have is that they are very close to Japan, Korea, China, you know, these production networks. So I think, you know, you cannot... Uh, uh, you cannot uh, ignore the fact that they're more geographically advantaged than Brazil, right? I mean, what is Brazil surrounded with? I mean, no offense, I, I love that region, but I mean, economically sure. speaking, I yeah. mean, even if the Philipp Philippines and Indonesia were probably to sleep, I mean, eventually, you know, they'll be woken up by Japanese investors and, and Chinese and all of that, right? So I think proximity to economic engines was always an advantage they had, right? And we have had bouts of industrialization in both countries, right? Uh, uh, but of course, the problem of Philippines and Indonesia is geography, right? In a different sense, because they're also, archipelagic country, right? So, so they are close to the to the engines of growth, but at the same time, they're 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 far away from their own provinces, right? So that, that's that's the kind of thing. So you really need to build the basic infrastructure, right? But my sense is, thanks to you know all this BRIS stuff, not only the Chinese one and all, there is a good feature, and especially because of digital infrastructure, I think. Uh, we are much more interconnected in ways that was not possible years ago, and that's why I'm I'm cautiously optimistic about uh, Indonesia's prospect. They have gone, they have come really. I mean, considering this country never had democratic experience, like never, never. Like Sukarno, that was not democracy. He called it guided democracy. Uh, so hard though, no way, man. <laughs> I mean, we over there, totally, total dictatorship, right? Uh, but soft-spoken version of Sukarno. So you know, their democracy is just what, like, I mean. Joko is just the second directly elected president of Indonesia after It's SPY. amazing to think about. It's amazing yeah. how yeah. far they have come. And like, yes, I mean, I, I, I wrote on Al Jazeera, like I, I wrote like Indonesia's uh, betrayed revolution because of course we were, there were super high expectations of Jokowi, right? He was like the Obama of Asia back in yeah. the days. Now yeah, it's that's more like, well put, yes. Now it's more like he's, <laughs> and is he the Duterte of Indonesia? I think he's neither of them, right? I mean, he definitely is a populist, but he's much more progressive populist, right? Mm. Uh, and, and than, 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 than Duterte or Trump and all mm. these people, right? And, you know, Indonesia is slowly but steadily moving in the right direction. I, I, and I, I'm, I'm, I, over the years, my visits to Indonesia, I've really seen how far they have come. Their technocratic and academic community, uh, and and it's my also sense is Indonesia has a more a, a, a more inclusive development relative. I mean, it's it's shocking because Indonesia is still a resource exporting country, and that generally creates very unequal patterns of growth. But compared to the Philippines, it seems that the middle class of Indonesia is more steadily growing than that of the Philippines. Although mm -hmm. I would say the Philippine middle class is at least around 20, 25 million, which is more or less like population of Australia. It's not small. But you still have 50, 40 million people at least uh, who are close to the poverty line or below. So that's a big problem. In Indonesia, they're more moving towards 100 million middle class uh, by some counts. So it's it's quite an interesting. And then, of course, because Indonesia has the size, right, the economies of scale also favors them to become the alternative hub for uh, Japan or Chinese manufacturing in the region uh, next to Thailand and potentially Vietnam, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Vietnam is so close to China, so Delta per, level, per uh, river Delta is, is very close. So that advantages Vietnam, but Indonesia could be definitely uh, the hub of production for many multinational companies, especially Japanese companies down the road. And because the domestic market is so large, you rather build carts there and then sell straight to your customers. So they have the economies of scale that 
that gives them the kind of advantage. Uh, yeah. There are 300 million people. I mean, people, you know, this is what I hate. Like people say, oh, Southeast Asia, small countries. For heaven's sakes, like Indonesia is twice bigger than Mexico. Does anyone call Mexico a small country? I mean, I heard many things about Mexico, many unfair stuff. I love Mexicans. But, but no one says Mexico is a small country. Well, Indonesia's population is almost twice that of Mexico. I mean, this is insane when I hear in small Southeast Asian countries. Are you I think, joking? I think it's because people just geographically in their mind, they just put in Asia. In they look, they, like, well, they look at China and they look at India. And then they say, yeah, yeah, yeah. well, so we all these countries in the, it, well, exactly. Then on the map, and even physically, if you look to the South, you've got Australia, which is a whole continent. Yeah, so yeah. if you like, not to speak about population, but just in terms of size and people's minds, when they think of the region, they just say, oh, like 10 small clustered countries that are sort of somewhere <laughs> the between yeah. these other huge sort of big geographic spaces yeah. and, and civilizational big states or whatever. The, uh, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and, and the map. I, so I see that. But I mean, people think. Japan is small on the map too, but you know, they became almost the number one superpower and they sure. have what, 100 plus million people, 150 million, I think at some point. Mm. So, you know, I mean, th- that's the point. These are, these are fertile islands. You can mm. pack a lot of people inside of them. I mean, I think, <laughs> and island people like making babies, including pandemic. I don't know, like, I'm seeing friends right and left Really, already first anniversary of their babies. My I mean, goodness, my goodness, Lots this is how long this pandemic has been going. Wow, so, wow, huge wow. populations. You're talking about 300 million in Indonesia. You're talking mm. about, I mean, not now, they're like 250 plus, but they're going to move towards 300 million. Mm. Philippines, 100, what, 15 million by some estimates. I saw. Mm. So, if you look at the 15 largest countries by population, three or four of them are from Southeast Asia, and mm. you call them small i mean like top 15 out of what 200 plus countries that's a good point it's a good point that's insane and so so just to end on this point i really see indonesia already as a middle power on its own terms right so middle power there's a debate on what it it means right but there's a lot of mumbo jumbo but basically middle power is that you have you have enough strategic autonomy not to be dictated upon by external powers i think indonesia checks that and then you have enough resources and and strategic act, uh, proactiveness to shape also at least your immediate environment. Again, check, Indonesia has that. And then you also have a potential eventually to be a superpower down the road, given your trajectory. And all, again, Indonesia checks that. But I would say even Vietnam and the Philippines have that potential too down the road by the sheer size of their population, the sheer size of their GDPs. I mean, we're gonna we're looking at multiple trillion dollar economies in, in mm. Southeast Asia. Mm. Thailand, Philippines, Vietnam, Indonesia has already has surpassed that a few years ago, right? Sure. So once you talk about trillion dollar economies, that put things into perspective, right? Yes. Um, and, and, and in that sense, that's why I said the future of ASEAN is ASEAN mini lateralism. ASEAN multilateralism is deadlocked because of this um, mindless insistence on unanimity, not really consensus, unanimity, right? Um, in the past, that's not how ASEAN worked. ASEAN intervened in Cambodia. It backed the Khmer Rouge regime for a while against the Vietnam back regime after invasion of Cambodia in 1979. And then later on, it forced Hun Sen and other people to introduce democratic elections in the 1990s. Uh, th- that was all done minilaterally, minilaterally. There was no consensus. It's like, hey, boys, who wants to go in? Go, go and jump, right? They did exactly the same in East Timor. Can you explain that, sorry, just a little more specifically, what exactly is minilateralism as a concept? Mini, so multilateralism, so minilateralism is ad hoc, flexible, uh, 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 cooperative arrangement among like-minded countries on a specific issue for a specific time. So let's say, I don't know, like there's a tsunami, right? There was a tsunami in Asia. Mm, yes. Let's say Australia, US, and China work to help people uh, dealing with tsunami. Mm-hmm. You can call that a mini lateral arrangement. So in short, I think the future is this, quad working with key ASEAN countries on China. Because ASEAN 10, good luck with that. You're never going to get anything against China from ASEAN 10. But Indonesia, Philippines, Singapore, this... Uh, you know, you might get something out of it if you work on a multilateral basis. So you work through and around ASEAN multilateralism and you work on a multilateral space. So you can work with Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, specifically on South China Sea, right? So quad powers can work with them plus Europeans. Uh, you, can, you can call it, I don't know, G8 or G9 or a new, uh, like something like France, that. France, Britain, Germany, 
uh, Indonesia, Singapore, Vietnam, Philippines, India, Japan, uh, US. Or G- so, you know, you can look at the other alternatives here whereby only on a specific issue of South China Sea, they work together. So we also have many lateral arrangements, like for instance, certain countries within ASEAN, not on the level of ASEAN, are working on counterterrorism. For instance, patrols in the Malacca Strait, counterterrorism or counter piracy. Patrols between uh, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, and the, among Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines in the Sulan celibacy. This is what we call mini lateralism. Mm, mm. uh, you know, I keep on talking about mini lateral, mini lateral. Probably people will call me Mr. Mini Lateral, but I want I don't want to be called mini on anything. But, Mr. but mini. really, <laughs> mini lateralism is the way forward for me. Sure. Because insisting on multilateralism is just you're asking for paralysis and trouble, right? But I got a question. What? How do you build the institution to facilitate minilateralism? Because it seems to me typically an institution is like having about members in the club and then, you know, multilateral institutional frameworks. We're very familiar with that. How do you make it so decentralized and open such that you can sort of like becomes more like a smorgasbord, pick and choose your different players and, and you know, let's go. Yeah, so know, how, how does this happen? Yes, yeah, so the quad itself is a form of minilateralism. So you don't have a headquarters like ASEAN headquarters in Jakarta or NATO headquarters in yes. know, in, 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 in Belgium, whatever. Um, so that, 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 that's, that's how it works. It's not formalized, top-down command structure. It's not like European <laughs> Union. Uh, you, you don't have that, right? Mm. Uh, what you have is that your foreign ministers, your defense ministers constantly talk to each other, coordinate positions, your militaries constantly uh, do joint drills and exercises. Your technical ministers talk about how to uh, protect yourself against uh, 5G shenanigans potentially by China. You know, that's how you do it. You know, so you're not so in your face. You create an organization and say we have a military alliance. You don't do that. But you constantly coordinate among your top mm. officials, the so-called two plus twos, two plus twos. So quad is a form of minilateralism. If you look at it, you know, yeah. I, I mean, I have called it uh, half sarcastically as Asian NATO or actually Asian NATO with uh, or NATO with Asian Asian right? characteristics right exactly <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a NATO but it doesn't have command NATO structure. based on Asian values or something like yeah, that yeah exactly but you know <laughs> it's very flexible and open but it does the job right it got China's attention it got sure. everyone's attention for better yeah. or for worse so I believe uh, quad plus ASEAN, mini lateral coordinations is really the way forward and actually a realistic way. As I said, there's just no way you can get 10 countries to agree to say anything significant against China. It's just mm. never going to happen. Well, but the G7 Indonesia struggles, Indonesia. even with seven countries, and they're yeah, but all Indonesia culturally or politically more closely aligned. I mean, as ASEAN. simple as that. If yeah. you're a Cambodia and one third of your national budget comes from China, and then you have zero territorial uh, interests in South China Sea, why on earth are you going to risk yourself? You know, I mean, it's just logical. I mean, why sh- I mean I, I'm, I'm actually with Cambodia on this. Like, yeah. why is everyone bashing Cambodia? Why should Cambodia sacrifice itself? Stick it the back problem out. is, if you have unanimity-based decision-making process, you know that China knows that you have a veto, right? Because if it's unanimity, you want... So if you know that China knows that you have a veto, there's automatic pressure on you. Not to, you know, agree to anything because you'll be blamed. The China said, you, had, you could have vetoed that. Why didn't I do that? I'm going to, you know. So it's unfair. It's unfair to come both. In fact, if it, I mean, I'm not a fan of Hunsen, but the Hunsen had the point when in, uh, I think in 2016, it was like in complete exasperation. He said, like, I don't care about this arbitration award. And all. Why are we getting dragged into this? He got a point. Get, let them lose. Let them lose. Just keep this among core countries in ASEAN and deal with this accordingly. Let's not bring in the, you know, in, in Filipino, there's a, there's a expression like, uh, it's called saling pusa, like let all the cats join in. Like maybe not, <laughs> maybe let's just get a few of the guys and then let's get <laughs> to work. Don't let it's all great. the cats in, right? Brilliant you know, point. I, I love cats, but I'm saying like, that's, that's, that's the Filipino expression, which I think perfectly makes sense. Like this is saling pusa, like you're letting every cat to get into the room. <laughs> It's a mess, you know. Let's just okay. get one or two nice Persian cats. Split and up the get... cats. It's yeah, tough. It's... it's tough herding cats, as people say, you know right? So you so can't herd cats. You, you can't herd ten mind. separate countries in Southeast Asia. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. They're not like puppies, or yeah. so maybe keep it. You know, yeah, distribute keep it. it. Keep, keep it, it intimate, source. right? Keep, keep it, it close. Source. Keep it intimate. Keep it effective. Mm. That's what we want. Okay. That's okay. What so. So I love that you brought it back to South South China Sea because that sort of brings us back to where we started, uh, Richard. So I've noticed you love to start a lot of your articles and books with historical 
analogies, which are always quite fun and thought-provoking to read. Uh, you recently likened today's South China Sea to the Balkans in the early 20th century, i.e. a breeding ground for the next global catastrophic conflict. How do you see the events of this year so far in the South China Sea? And I'd like to take the historical comparison one step further, if I may, with you and ask if you had to predict what event could be the, assass the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, what would it be? Wow. I, again, I'm not a historian by training, but I mean, history has been an obsession from a very, very young age. I mean, probably before Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse, I was already reading about Greek oppression wars. You know, like I was that kind of kid. You know, yeah, like, it shows in your writing. Yeah. It's like awkward. You know, like I knew Brilliant. more about race than Disneyland yeah. of, mm, you know, good. 500 BC, you know. Um, so <laughs> that's that's more or less my personal background. So that that makes people understand why I am what I am, you know. Uh, and all the weirdness of it. Um, so what you know, for me, um, history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes, right? As right. as, uh, as Mark Twain that. said, yeah, Mark it Twain really rhymes that. in many uh, in many cases that are dear to my heart and my, focus of my research, right? So you know, I always hear is like, but no one wants war, but but China has no reason to block South China Sea because China, blah blah blah, it straight passes that, like, you know. No one wanted First World War to happen. I mean, I mean, go back to the works of Keynes. It was life in the, you know, the Belle Epoque, right? The beautiful decades of the late 19th century. Like your, your, your shoes was, was from Italy, right? Your, your radio was from Germany, your car, you know, like it was absolutely globalized, interdependent world, right? I mean, for heaven's sake, the, the guys in charge of, 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 of uh, Russia, Germany, and England were cousins. Right, I mean, just look at the letters between Wilhelm and Nicholas and and you know George or whatever. I mean, they were cousins. They were first name basis. And Kaiser of German Wilhelm was the most annoying cousin, but he was cousin. He was love when he went to Britain. Like that. What I mean. So if you look, if you read books like you know like uh, Guns of August uh, mm. or, or even the Post American Classic. World of Zachary, like you look at the how they were projecting Victorian England. And you know, the last thing you would think would be a first world war, or anyone would dare to go against England at that point. It was such a dominant empire, and boom, it it happened because you can sleepwalk into conflict if you always underestimate yours and others' ability to be stupid, right? Because mm -hmm. everyone can be really stupid. Second, when there's a lot of domestic political uncertainty, that tends to feed into foreign policy. And that's absolutely our case. So one of the problems in the run-up to the First World War was France, for instance, one of the core countries involved, had hyper-rotation of its foreign ministers and top officials. It was a very messy, what was it, like Third Republic or whatever? It was a messy domestic policy. You don't know who's in charge, right? Uh, in, in Russia, at the same time, you had the rise of hardliners, Slavic nationalists, and the decline of the more reasonable, smart people. I mean, as you can see in my background, I mean, I love Russian history. So, I mean, this is... This is after the first failed Russian revolution. So there was a uh, there was a period of reform, and then uh, then the hardliners come up. So you know, so domestic politics also matters. Who are the counterparts here, and everything like that. Um, uh, so that, and then the other one is uh, you know everyone thinking that the war will be quick because you know I have the technology and and will. So if I come in strong in, everyone else will blink. So it's about posturing, right? Boom. Mm. And then, of course, rise of popular nationalism, uh, you know, English nationalism, German nationalism, very strong. Uh, but here's where things get interesting. Nationalism in the Balkans, really the backwaters of Europe, then maybe also now for by some accounts. Who cares about Balkans, right? I mean, sure. in theory, right? It was like a province of Ottoman. Owned by the Ottomans, Ottoman exactly. Yep. But, you know, the smartest guy of the 19th century, probably in politics at least, you know, uh, Bismarck said, mm. you know, one damn foolish thing in that region is going to create the next conflagration. He said that 20 years before the war, if I'm not mistaken, right? Uh, and this was when he was being pushed aside by Wilhelm. Again, a big problem. He took out the pragmatic smart guy and put an idiot like Wilhelm there, uh, fully in charge of foreign policy establishment. Um, so what happened in Balkans was you had a bunch of nationalists in Balkans get involved with a kind of a middling major power, which was Austria, a kind of declining power. So all other rising powers, right, were just watching out what's going to go because they want a piece of price, whether it's Balkans or Austria, right? 
And then the Germans. So, and then everyone was thinking if they go in strong, the other ones will blink. And then they all went. So it's game theory, right? It's a game theory when the game badly goes wrong, right? It's like this movie, right? It is like horror comedy movies, right? Everyone's thinking it's like they're going to just do some, you know, uh, you know, uh, schmuck move, and then every, but it just didn't work it's like good that. From so, bad to worse. so what yeah. happened there is what happened there is once Austria got involved in the Balkans, the Russians backed the 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 hardliners in the Balkans, right? The Serbians and all, and then the Germans immediately backed the Austrians, and each of them had each other in mind, working it through the Austrians and the Balkans. So the proxy, so it was not only the tail whacking the dog, but the dog also thinking that it, it controls its tail. So the two were working <laughs> against each other at the same time. You can see Great how analogy. dangerous the situation is, right? The, the last yeah. time we had something similar to that was the was uh, the Peloponnesian War, right? Again, if you look at the beginning of Peloponnesian War, the big two powers were Athens and Sparta. And then, you know, the smaller ones did mumbo jumbo, one gets him. So we had exactly similar dynamic in First World War. And if you look at Second World War, it's actually a continuation of First World War. Let's just be very clear about that. Sure. Germany sure. just felt they didn't get the right settlement, even though mm. they signed an armistice. So Hitler, who is not even German, it's an Austrian. Again, Austrians were involved in this, got the ball rolling, right? And what's also very interesting in the First World War, if you look at the works by uh, by Neil Ferguson, for instance, his work, yes. Pit War, it's fantastic because it looks at... England could have played an intervention role and stopped the ball rolling, uh, the fireball rolling. But even England went stupid at some point, which is quite amazing too. Like, it, the Brits were supposed to be the epitome of, of craftsmanship and deceit, right? Strategic deceit. Sure. But even they played it full because it's, the right people were not in power, right? Mm. Or the right people did not do it. So this is where everyone sleepwalked into the conflict thinking the war will be over within a month. And then by the next spring, and then it stretched year after year after year. And then there'll be a second world war, which will be essentially a continuation of the first world war. So when you look at that, this is Victorian era, Belle Epoque, highly educated people, aristocrats, smartest people, you know, increasingly democracy is coming in, votation even in Germany, in Prussia was there. And yet this happened. And yet this happened, right? So when you look at that, I'm not sure if as human, as human beings, we have genetically changed enough for me to be very confident in us. So it's just fascinating that the Chinese have been obsessively um, working through history. Uh, I think CGTN had a series back then called CCTV, Rise and Fall of Empires. They studied all of these empires that failed, right? Japan, Germany, Soviet. But what I also realized is that the Chinese are now obsessed about one case, fall of the Soviet empire. Yes. And they're so obsessed not being the Soviet empire that they can't turn into the other ones. That's mm -hmm. the fear I have today. That's it. Mm. So when I see this outburst of popular national, including from my friends in China, do you really believe South China Sea belongs to them and all? I mean, the complete, I mean, what? I mean, yeah, but I, I, there's, but there's that's no my point. Like, acknowledgement that's my point. of the origins of the nine dash line and where it actually came from. And that is a 20th century if phenomenon. You're, if, you're, yeah. if you're being fed uh, nonsense, Blah, blah, dash for year after year from your formative years. I cannot blame you if you still believe in that, right? Mm. Whether genuinely or not. And by the way, the uh, incentive alignments, I mean, to be nationalist, I mean, was it even Lang Lang? I think joined some of the South China Sea stuff. I mean, right? The pianist guy, I mean, he, mm. he did some, you know, and you look at the rappers in China talking about South China. I mean, like yeah. the complete co optation of even the celebrities in, in China, you know. So when I look at that, I'm not sure we learned a lot from history. And no. then I look at the US, look at Trump, look at Trumpian people, look at the Pompeos and all. I'm not also sure they learned a lot from how Britain got wrong, the origins of First World War. So, and do so you on and so forth. Yeah, do you think then the if there is a incident that sparks it all, it could be something a little bit like a a fire sh a ship being, you know, uh, having a fire attack, a bit like the start of the novel 2034, which I wanted to bring up earlier because you, you said, you know, that the South China Sea is a great place for like a, an action or military novel right now. Well, there are, there are American uh, uh, former naval commanders who are writing books about predicting, you know, the next global conflict. I'm not conflict sure they're the best stuff. people to do novels, but yeah, I appreciate the effort. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not my Actually, good friend. You've said the New Statesman podcast, uh, podcast host said exactly the same thing. <laughs> Actually, yeah, but yeah, no, but it's it's interesting uh, to to thought experiment, right? And India's role, I think, was 
was most surprising. But anyway, not to get in, I, I would love to have the author on, on this show, but anyway, yeah, yeah. not to get into, into that. But do you think it's going to be a standoff like we've had with the Philippines and, and the Chinese in a particular reef? Or is it going to be something else? Is it going to be something about, uh, you know, some of the European frigates or uh, aircraft carriers coming through the waters? Is it going to be, do you think it will be on the sea itself or it will be something else? Well, I mean, what's your yeah. hunch with this stuff? Yeah, then again, Balkans was, no one thought Balkans will be enough for all these powers to go and killing each other for years, right? Uh, South China obviously is, sounds much more important, but then again, people will say, oh, with all this trade and interdependence, who wants to go to war over South China Sea, right? Or yeah. a bunch of islands, if I'm going to use Obama's term, which was which mm. was not really welcome. And I keep on telling them, don't repeat those stuff, right? Uh, so, yeah, um, you know, just look at how the, the South China Sea disputes are being militarized and militiaized, right? Just look at the number of militia forces, mm. really goons, right? Mm -hmm. uh, just hovering around there and some of them are getting a little bit uh, um, a little bit funny around American warships, right? I mean, you could imagine some stupid thing could happen. I mean, 2019, you had an incident in Reed Bank when a Chinese militia, suspected militia, just rammed into a Filipino fisherman and almost drowned 22 of them. If those 22 died, they were saved, by the way, by the Vietnamese. Uh, of course, the question is, why are the Vietnamese fishermen there? They were also illegally there. But God bless them, they saved the Filipino fishermen. But if they died, the situation would have been very, very different. I wouldn't have been surprised there'll be attack on Chinese people in the Philippines. Among them. I hope not. You know, I'm really against that. But you know, you can imagine the fascist elements or hyper nationalist elements using that for all sorts of nasty stuff. I'm very worried about that. Um, mm -hmm. I'm also worried about possibility. You know, China with putting all of these missile systems. Let's say Filipino defense minister or Vietnamese defense minister is flying over for surveillance to position, and then boom, he's shut down. Then what's going to happen? Then what's, you, you can imagine in the age of social media and algorithms, the most, the craziest interpretations will immediately go viral, right? And then you can imagine anchors, everyone will, will jump in, in an, because, you know, the Chinese think they're the only one humiliated for hundred years. For even six Filipinos, we have been humiliated for <laughs> half a millennium. Hundreds, you could say, yeah, right? exactly. <laughs> and we're itching also for reasserting ourselves. The Indians also have had their own humiliation, right? The Mughals from the North mm. came, then the British and all of that. You know, the Chinese have not forget, they are among fellow humiliated people who are all looking for a way to reassert themselves. And by the way, Vietnamese who really, really are angry with the Chinese for all this millennial conflict. So, you know, that's a very hypercharged environment both in terms of ide ideology, hyper-nationalism, but also in terms of weapon systems they're putting on, putting there, right? So in that environment, you know, we are really flirting with, with uh, catastrophe here. I mean, at the rate we're going. And, you know, I really hope that folks in, in capitals that matter, whether it's Zhongnan High or whether it's DC and all, I mean, they'll make some tough, tough decisions. And this wolf warrior diplomacy was like really getting me like worried. Like, you know, I mean, you saw that, right? I mean, this whoever looking guy, um, uh, the Chinese foreign ministry guy, right? Saying all sorts of stuff like fake news about, uh, you know, the origins of, of, they have their own lab leak theory against US, mm. you know? Uh, mm. and, and then you had the Filipino foreign minister who got gagged order now, said that he yes. like cussed at, at the, the Chinese, yeah? Oh yes, you know, when, uh, what's his, have... his name again? Yeah, he used some pretty foul language. When uh, uh, yeah. when you uh, yeah. when you have um, diplomats, diplomats going, I mean, swearing at each other. That's the canary like... in the coal mine. I mean, that's that's yeah. not even a, that's like an eagle. It's like a rap coal. battle on Twitter. I, I'm, just saying, like, <laughs> I'm not I'm not liking it, and I'm worried because like in the Philippines, I'm hearing more and more anti-China sentiment, like just hatred for anything Chinese, like Chinese people. And it doesn't make sense. A lot of Filipinos are Chinese Filipinos. Yeah, sure. It's ridiculous, right? Yes. Our national hero, Rizal, was part Chinese. I mean, it doesn't make sense. But So that worries me. That really worries me. And converse of that, anti-foreign xenophobic sentiments in China against a lot of its neighbors, right? Mm. And, you know, Taiwan, as nice as it is, you know, you, you sometimes you hear stuff, right? Um, so I'm not happy about it. I'm very worried about this. I'm very, mm. very worried. That, that we're, we're so you know i think kissinger had it right not always but you know in his book world order he said something like asia is kind of up for grabs no one accepts 
no one else as the hegemon in the region, right? The, the Vietnamese have their own idea. Like in Europe, it's kind of understood, like, yeah, the Germans. Germans, are yeah, basically. Leader. Although let, let the French. French play second right? fiddle. Yeah, and then they the like British to. British never belong here, right? So yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. Time, that's right? the consensus. Yeah. The Middle East understands, like, okay, it was really the Turks and the Persians who were the big boys. But, you know, we don't want to go back then. So we kind of challenge it. But, so, but there's an implicit understanding who are the big boys, right? Here, no one accepts it. You know, Filipinos will never accept, you know, China as the big boy. They kind of had to accept Americans and Europe. You know, but no, they will never accept. The Japanese will never accept that. The Vietnamese will absolutely never accept that. And you think Indians will accept Indians that? Indians, no definitely way. not. Right? Absolutely. So this is the problem. Uh, everyone hates each other so much in this region that they rather have outside powers in some sort of a semi-hegemonic position, right? Not fully hegemonic, but semi-hegemonic. This is the tragedy and this is the danger here. And China, I think Beijing uh, believes that they can recreate the tributary system in, in of course, in a, with 21st century characteristics. And I think they, they're really wrong about that. I mean, mm. you, know, you can read it in their language behind the, the lines when you talk to them. It's like, there's this idea like, oh, all of you were like little whatever kingdoms. We were the real big guys, here. which I can't understand. And, and you know, the, the tragedy of China is that I think Edward Lutwak, among others, were good observers of this. They never ha uh, had to deal with other major empires like Persians and Romans, right? They had to always deal with each other. There was a kind of understanding like you're not the only you know, game in town. You have to learn diplomacy. The Chinese never had to learn that because they were never... Himalayas separated them from India. India was never really a consolidated empire like Rome or Persians or Ottomans and all. Uh, you know, so to, because they were surrounded by all of these smaller countries and kingdoms, their statecraft is by, by uh, default tributary. I mean, it's just different versions of that. Mao had its own version, right? Fund all these proxies, communist movements. It was big failure. Now they got the money. So Essentially, Xi Jinping is Mao with the money, right? <laughs> he wants to <laughs> do that on a larger scale. Mm. But it's just not going to work because people mm. are not going to accept a return to the past. Because from the Chinese, again, this is Beijing, but not the Chinese people, but the Beijing ideology, I, I can see the Zhongnanhai ideology is that the 500 years of Western dominance, as it was an aberration. They rather look at the thousands of years before that, right? When China was a dominant force. So for them, we're just returning to normal. Uh, but you know, it seems it's ironic because being Marxist, they should understand a little bit of dialectics. You cannot ever return to the past, right? You always mm. have a new synthesis, right? And this is where the rest of Asia is. Like, we neither want to be under Americans nor Europeans and definitely not under the Japanese or Chinese or anything, any of that, right? Mm. And, and you can really see that in surveys, like in surveys in ASEAN, the, uh, if you look at the most authoritative surveys of opinion leaders, like the Institute for Southeast Asian Studies uh, annual surveys, Always on top, you'll see Europe and Japan as preferred mm. partner because neither of them are big powers, right? Sure, sure. Because they're small enough to be able to work with. Mm. And both US and China are not the most preferred ones exactly for the reason because they don't want anyone in charge of this region. This mm. is the default uh, ideology of everyone, even Duterte, even Jokowi. I mean, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, all of them don't want anyone to be the big boss here, right? It's, no, that's, that's really, I think, uh, hit upon the undercurrent strategic thinking and and sort of the overall uh, diplomatic philosophy of the region so it's I visceral it's yeah. almost visceral i would say it's visceral yeah it's been a brilliant conversation richard i thank you so much for your time you've been very generous sharing your insights with us today there's so much more we can get into next time i can tell from your answers yeah there's there's so much richness to your uh, to your thoughts and your insights. So there is, uh, yeah, plenty of potential to take this further. I'm so excited. But, you know, our listeners, you know, must be reeling from all the stuff that they can, all the, all the nuggets that. we can get out of this conversation. <laughs> no, no, but I do have a follow up question. Where can the listeners go to find out more about your stuff? Because as you said, you've written what? Is it over a thousand articles? You got several. Probably 2,000 awesome, articles. 2,000 yeah, articles. I, count, yeah. 2, I mean, articles. just Google My your books, name. Well, it's you everywhere. Can find yeah. it on Amazon, yeah. among others. I'm actually working on a new book right now. Oh, please Mel tell us. Melbourne yes. University Press. Uh, oh, okay. God willing, it will come out next year, hopefully, middle of next year or so. Well, once the world opens up, hopefully. Uh, the title is China's New Empire. So very oh, reflective. Oh, oh, and nice. I'm going to exactly argue why that empire is much more fragile and not so empire as as we understand empire, <laughs> right? So it's an economic it empire. 
but mm. there's going to be a lot of geopolitical pushback. So I'm going to look at this kind of a, at these five major case studies, uh, mm. kind of a tongue shape also nine dash line from Taiwan to Philippines to Malaysia to Indonesia and Vietnam, right? Mm-hmm. And then the broader picture. Look at all of these granular uh, pushbacks on the ground uh, mm. to, to, to kind of uh, debunk all this nonsense I'm hearing uh, in policy circles and media. It's like, oh, China won it. They won over Asia. Everyone, you know, like, what the hell? You know, uh, like, who is, who is the time, Kishore? Talk to people here. That's the last thing on the mind of people. Yeah, now. yeah. Ch- has China already won? Uh, the Singaporean economist, uh, Kishore. Oh, yeah, yeah. The Mahbub, uh, Kishore yeah. Mahbub. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. That that gets a good audience in the West because you know. I mean, of course, I, Westerns this love is that. This the trick, right? Yeah. Scare the West; they're gonna lose their power so that you get more help from them. That, that's yes, the trick. Yes, I, yes, I, yes, I hate that. Trick. I hate that when they do that. But it, it's they're effective. They're more creative ways of doing. Like there are people who made the cottage industry out of it. Like mm, or oh, China sure. has won. I mean, like. Are you kidding me? Like, no offense, our good friends, but push the analysis a bit. And by the way, in this book, you're going to see Foucault, you're going to see Zizek, you're going to see Hegel, uh, you're going to see Kant. So I'm going to go deep philosophy and deep psychology to do also deep geopolitics without making it too boring. Only the opening chapter is real theoretical, but the rest you'll see a lot of Duterte quotes. You'll see a lot of Chai Ing-wen quotes, talk with Chai Ing-wen. Oh, you'll lovely. see uh, my conversation with Mahathir there being reflected. You'll see quotes from Jokowi, uh, our Vietnamese friends. So it's going to be sprinkled by, so it's going to be, it's not going to be travel log, Kaplan-esque. It's going to be a little bit more academic. This is an academic press, but it's not going to be also your, your typical stuff and probably even more exciting than some of my recent works. Uh, but as I said, everything I discuss here, you can just, Google my name next to that topic, something will come up absolutely for sure, right? Mm-hmm. And I and a lot of them, the man. Uh, lo- sorry, I spoke to Cal. And a lot of them are are. Uh, I think you don't need subscription, or if you need subscription, like Nikkei, so you can have three free every month. You know, so all I'm saying is that my ideas are very accessible. Um, you can give me hours, but it will not be enough. That's why I write because writing. That's what one thing I learned from the Greeks. If you want to have, if you want to last long in terms of your ideas write it down right and that's that's where they had an edge over i think far more sophisticated civilizations and empires right yeah that's why we know a lot about greeks because they just wrote it down right even though most of it's probably propaganda right but not in my case (laughs) it's all peer-reviewed so that's it uh thank you brilliant richard thank you so much uh, uh, should should people follow you on twitter or linkedin oh yeah yeah yeah. Yeah. uh it's pretty easy to find me online i mean uh, okay just okay just richard hidarin or Richard Foronda Hedarin, which is uh, my page on Facebook, and then Twitter uh, again, Richard Hedarin. All is Rich Hedarin, and then also Instagram. Uh, okay, it's, brilliant. It's, it's the same. Yeah, we'll uh, include I'm all the show notes course. in in the episode. Uh, yeah. Sure Once I get TikTok, I'll tell you. But I need to buy a new phone for that because I don't trust. <laughs> okay. <anyways. laughs> okay. Okay. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> That's it. That's it. But Thank you so much. TikTok. I'll see you on TikTok too. See yeah, you on sure. TikTok. It's it's exciting times. Thank you so much again, Pleasure. and we'll uh, join you on next time on Policy People Podcast. Pleasure. Have a good day. Okay, great. I just clap it out like that. Oh, Jeez, that's brilliant. That? I thought it was like <laughs> we're yeah. like thirty minutes an hour. That's great. That's oh, that great. Good. We had a lot it's of fun. You no, pushed no, no. me. I mean, uh, no, I, I, I'm so I, I don't have uh, off, I don't often have people who can really go the depth that that you you did with me. So I'm I'm really appreciated because, you know, some people uh, they just they just don't go beyond their immediate specialization. You know, yeah. like they'll they'll yeah, say stuff. Scared. Yeah, um, but I I love what I love what you do. I mean, this is obviously how you get to your level by just sort of branching out and writing stuff about world politics here there and everywhere and just keep keep on churning out stuff you eventually refine your thinking on so many different issues so you you're confident across the board you can talk about all this stuff so so it's it's yeah, I mean, kudos to you Richard, was that, uh, you're an inspiration uh, really with Hegel was that he was yeah. keep on he kept on writing the same book <laughs> he, he kept yeah. on yeah. different <laughs> permutations but but more or less that's it i mean you, you by by writing and really thinking deep about it, that's how you learn about stuff mm. i mean otherwise you're just going to pick up moderate statements and cliches and blah 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 at the mm. same if you want to question cliches and common wisdom you have to have something to back it up right and, yeah. and in four years i've been in the minority uh my arguments about asean my arguments about china uh, i was always in the minority but now, you know, it's getting a little bit more mainstream. So I, I mm. feel vindicated in a lot of these issues, but I still have other crazy ideas I have to push, which I think will make sense once climate change hits really hard, once 
technological disruption drives a lot of people into un unemployment. You know, these are things I discuss in the final chapter of my Indian Pacific, but these are themes that could be a whole book in themselves, right? Which, yes. I, which I'm at the back of my head, I'm researching and then thinking them through, right? So you're a professor uh, there in, in at, is it National Defense University? I can't quite uh, So in, in now Miller. I'm a, yeah. I, I wear many hats, right? So yeah, exactly. among yeah. others, I'm a professor I'll shareholder. So it's a university uh, appointment on geopolitics at the Polytechnic University of the Philippines. Polytechnic, I, that's what it is. Yeah, I also regularly, yes, do lectures at the National Defense College of the Philippines. Mm. I'm also now going to teach at San Beda University, which is the University of Duterte, where he graduated. So <laughs> among nice. others, right? And then let's see what happens next. Oh, uh, Cool. Uh, hey, do you know uh, Melissa uh, Conley Tyler from Melbourne University? I think so, yeah, but She's not, not, not big, very big like Asia yeah. person for yeah, yeah, I mean, Melbourne I'm University. Sure we bop into each other yeah. in, uh, in, in, in uh, events, Griffith Asia people. Yeah, Melbourne yeah, 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 yeah. That's what she oh, is. Yeah. She's like Asia uh, Link, which is like one of yes, Australia's yes, like new Colombo uh, plan. Melissa Conley, yes, yes, Tyler, yes, yes, blonde. Yes, yes, yes. No, no, no yeah. I'm absolutely. I'm sure we. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like you know, like my problem. I'm bad in names. Like I'm, ah. so, I'm good in numbers. I'm good in yes good names of like yes. I mean all this. There's so many things all inside my head. I forget the name of everyone else. So, yeah. but if you give me the face and all, I mean, it's like, oh yeah, yeah. I know exactly what day, what, when I, in what mood I saw yeah, her. I'm just know? trying to make connections here. Cause she's co just come to Taiwan recently. She's uh, at the, you know, the, um, Guofang Anquan Yuan Yuan here, like the, the, the main national right, defense right, think right, tank. Right. Yeah. And she's doing research on US Taiwan. Yeah. Oh, you've yeah, done yeah. stuff. Yeah. When you were at Zhengda, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. cause she's here and I'm helping her connect to like all these with all these Taiwanese politicians and stuff. And I was just wondering, cause you, cause she's like oh, Melbourne fine. university's big, you're like such a good friend then. Asia connected. Yeah. Oh no, she's going to jump okay, on the so show I as will, well. I'll bother yeah. you next. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you do that. I'll, I'll, I can help you there. Also, do you know Maria Ressa? Maria Ressa. Yeah. Are you yes, guys I mean, we like... know her, but no one can pin her down. She's like all over the place. Oh, no wonder. Exactly Cause that. she doesn't yeah, reply yeah. to any of my, I mean, not that I thought that she would reply straight away. Cause I know she's really, you know, no, really she, high profile, so but I, I, I've tried her at least twice and I was like, oh, okay, maybe she's busy keep or trying. something. Yeah, yeah keep, keep trying. trying. Hey. Okay, keep so trying. She's I mean, like the that, thing like with that. Maria is obviously she's in demand by everyone for understandable huge, reasons. Right? Yeah, exactly. Although, of course, that's yeah. raising eyebrows among a lot of people like uh, you're not the only one <laughs> doing the job here in the Philippines because Rappler is sure. relatively a small player in the Philippines. Actually, Inquirer, so uh, ABS CBN, Jimmy, they have far larger footprint. But internationally, internationally, uh, Rappler is really big. Rappler, yeah, yeah of course. I mean, Marissa was from CNN. She's very proactive, etc. So, but she in the Philippines, Ian it's show very different picture. Like it's very yeah. different because Rappler is English language, so it's more like the chattering classes, the middle class really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and well, you know, even in the English language, uh, I mean, just Facebook following and all. Rappler is relatively small. I mean, probably mm. two, three million versus 25 million, 30 million, 40 million of, <laughs> of other channels, right? So just online. I mean, I'm not even talking about television and everything like that. So, but right. yeah, uh, that's, 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 that's what, but as far as my rest is concerned, I am um, good luck. I mean, try to reach out to her. Mm. Uh, she's just all over the place. Uh, that, that's, she's that's got a great that's story. A, but yeah. my suggestion is why not reach out to other people in Rappler? It's not my yeah. Yeah, why not? Why not? Uh, yeah, who do you recommend? Who do you think I should? Fantastic. She's the one covering Duterte forever. Who's that? Uh, What's Pia Ranada. Pia P I A. Ranada. R A. Oh, she's fantastic. She's Pia fantastic. Pia Ranada. Okay. Yeah, you you can just put oh, yeah. P I A. I found her. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you could see there's a lot of stories about her because she's mm. the one who covered Duterte. Like, oh. she intimately knows Duterte. You want okay. Duterte stuff? Go to her. Mm. Uh, there's also uh, oh, but. Nikki Gutierrez already moved to Vice Asia. She used to be the number two of Maria Ressa, like kind of her protege. She, oh. uh, she's now head of Vice Asia in Singapore. Nikki who? Uh, Gutierrez. Gu uh, how do you spell it? G-U. Uh, yeah, Gu it's, it's Spanish. G-U-I-E-I-E-R. -E uh, I found it. G-U-T-I-E-R-R-E-Z. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, her, yeah, yeah, yeah. Her name, Nicole or Nikki or whatever. I'm oh, sorry. I, because sometimes we, we call each other by nicknames, yeah. So she's also great, and she worked with. Uh, you can actually find them also on on Twitter and all. Mm. I suggest you reach out to them, not just Maria Reza, because these yeah, are right. doing the stuff on the ground. They're, you know, uh, Pia, fantastic. I mean, I yeah. have huge respect for Pia. I mean, this the the. the I mean, there was once Duterte openly threatened her in front of everyone. It was horrible. I mean, geez, really. I mean, and she's just a small, tiny, skinny girl, you know, and she's so brave and held herself. 
I mean, Maria is, is all over the world, but these are the ones on the ground. Cool, cool. These are the okay. Foot soldiers. That's good. I'm I'll, sorry. I'll you know, I mean, mind. I'd rather give a large to them. I mean, but, anyways, that's a different topic. But yeah, Pia yeah, is great. And then Nikki, of course, was she, she, when uh, Maria expanded to Indonesia, she was the head of the Indonesian Bureau of Raptor. And then now oh. she's in Thais. She's fantastic. Yeah. So I really suggest you reach out to them yeah. and then they'll give you the Raptor story. And I also suggest reach out to Sheila Coronel. She's the dean of the Columbia Journalism School. She's she's like she's the best journalist probably that Asia has produced. Uh, investigative journalist, right? Sheila Co- Sheila Coronel. Put Columbia Cor- K or C C O R C O R. Yeah, yeah, Coronel. Canal. Okay. Yeah, Sheila. She's Sheila. Fantastic. I got it. Yeah. yeah, she's so good. I think she's the first woman dean of the journalism school. Well, Columbia. thanks for giving me girls because I really need yeah. more girls. Oh yeah, I do. Yeah. This is the Philippines, by the way. I'm yeah. minority. I go in panels. I'm the only guy most of the time. Really? Like, is it? Is that? Are, is that the normal? Such a matriarchal society. When oh, it that's to, great. Yeah, oh, that's interesting. Enough. Men, yeah. we're men, we're we're such oppressed minority <laughs> <laughs> good good yeah because like, like i gotta tell life- you man i'm not joking like i reach out to like plenty of, of female think tankers and stuff and they're ju- it's they don't say no but they're just more cautious like it takes two or yeah, three I mean, like they, 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 they ask it. questions I mean, they're like um you know can you like Send me a bit more about your background. Yeah, you just have to like work harder case, to like get them on. Question five yeah. minutes. Oh, dude, like, man, and you're, you, I mean, I invited you. Like, I, I would say almost a third of the male guests on my show invite themselves. And, you know, I don't say yes to all of them. I obviously am pretty picky, but but there are plenty yeah. of dudes who just come through LinkedIn. They're like, I want to get on your show. I can talk to you about AI. I want to, uh, I've had zero women. That's good. Uh, it's yeah, good. It's good. I, but I, I have zero that. women. I have, I, I have I like 10 that. dudes every couple of weeks that, yeah. and I have like yeah, no yeah, girls. Yeah. And do so more women, man, do I don't women, know. Do LGBT. There are a lot of LGBT activists. Yeah. Yeah, I think there are lots of fantastic gotta, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You got to get into those other topics like um, diversity kind of topics. I think that's where you well, you're Australian. Serve. You can yeah. handle this stuff. You guys yeah, are yeah. woke. You yeah, guys yeah. are the original woke. But yeah, <laughs> Philippines, most of our top experts are actually women. Uh, and I say this with absolute pride. I mean, our, our best China expert uh, was Eileen Baviera. God bless her soul. She passed away last year. Um, she was really the person, uh, mm. the person. Uh, she, she was like the mother. She was like the Merkel of, of the China watching people here in the Philippines. But again, if you look at a lot of top, uh, top experts in the country, they're, Philipp- they're women. Top mm. journalists, they're women. So oh, go cool. ahead. So cool. get more that. Filipino women involved yep. in the yep. Also, they have many, very smart uh, um, women involved. Um, uh, I suggest reach out also to the Habibi Center. Oh, I've just connected with them. Kim put you in touch with yeah, them. Yeah. Do you know Tao Fan? T A U F A N? I think he's, so. Yeah, yeah. Again, I'm by the I've, name, but, but I think I, I'm going to get your... jump on a webinar about Taiwan. And, and then also yeah. get, uh, I think he's feeling better now. Uh, get uh, people like from CSIS Jakarta who are fantastic. I mean, Ivan Laksamana is really good. Who? Laksa, Ivan, who? Laksamana. Ivan Laksamana. Laksamana. It's Spanish actually named Laksamana. Eva Laksamana. Okay. He's good. He's like the top Indonesia expert guy. I mean, and he's, 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 he's kind of like our batch. He's like millennial too and all. He's a very smart guy. Yeah. You can see stuff on, 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 on Twitter, online and all. He's really good. Um, you can check his writings easily. You can find it. So in Indonesia, I definitely suggest Ivan Laksamana. And then a woman, a great woman from South Asia. I'll suggest um, uh, Elina Noor. Who is now the I think the uh, vice president or something or vice director, the vice president of Asia Society in DC. I mean she's oh. really top level. Yeah, Elena Noor. But she was Elena E L E N A, L E L I N A. Elena and then Noor N E N double O R Noor. She's really good. Sorry, L double O. No no no. Elena E L I N A. Yep. Ah, yeah, Elena. Yes, correct. And then Noor. N O O R. Oh, Noor. Yeah, right. Noor. Okay, yeah, yeah. Very, yeah. Good. very okay, good, good. Very, very, very good, too. Um, okay, great. Oh, these are great people. Cool. I mean, I'm thinking about women, no? Uh, yeah. The, the interview. Uh, Australia. Uh, someone close to me in the past, I can also suggest. Um, yeah. But she's now based in Perth, but she's doing her doctoral in ANU. She does Indonesia. Uh, you can also reach out to her. Um, uh, wait, 
<laughs> Mario's. I don't forget the name. Oh, faces. Are, you're good with faces, not with names. That's cool. No, this person was my partner. <laughs> One second. Oh, sorry. Oh, <laughs> yeah, like, this, is morning. this is early. Yo, ask me so much questions. Uh, I <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. Don't, 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 I'm the stress. type who moves on. You know, I move on. So I need to yeah, too yeah, much yeah. move on. It's okay. No, it's okay. Um, Natalie. Sorry. Oh, my God. Sorry, yeah. Horrible. Natalie. <laughs> Natalie Sambi. Oh my God. Uh, say, it's I'm just between crazy. you and me. Yeah. Natalie who? <laughs> I will come to Taiwan, man. I... Natalie S A. What? I'll just write and Natalie A and U and then Indonesia. I'm sure it'll come up. Okay. Oops. Hello. I think the internet dropped out. Natalie Sambi. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think she got my, yeah, but anyways, yeah. 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 So you, you, I think you can also. So I'm thinking about women, no? Uh, yeah, no, that's good. That's this is what yeah, I need yeah. more of. Yeah, exactly. To, um, oh, so there are more. Uh, Vietnam also. Uh, Huang, sorry, the Vietnamese names are a little bit. Uh, let me. There's also a, a Vietnamese uh, friend uh, who's based in. Um, uh, ASPI, Australian Strategic Policy Institute. Oh, I know ASPI, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you just put ASPI, Southeast Asia, something like that. A, a, an Indonesian name should come out. She's fantastic, too. Oh my God, I'm horrible. <laughs> I'm so uh, bad. Ho at... Huang, Huang Le yeah, Huang, exactly. Yeah, Huang 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 Huang. Yeah, yeah, she's very good. Too. Okay, okay. Oh, oh, she's followed me on LinkedIn for ages and she sometimes gives me like events and stuff. Exactly. Oh, so tell her, I uh, somehow kind of like thought... overlook her. So yeah, sort of, because she was yeah. like pinging me about, can you put events on on, on your newsletter? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I, I mentally put her in the category of people who send me stuff about know, like, events, but not get... podcast guests. You I know, know, I know. Yeah. <laughs> That's the first reason not to invite someone when they <laughs> weird, weird, weird ping you. No, no, but yeah. she's fantastic. She's she's really smart. Um, oh, good. Uh, I think she even speaks Arabic. Oh, uh, anyways. Wow. I mean, she's still in Poland and then US and I mean, she's fantastic. She speaks all these languages. Oh, uh, she's crazy. Just Wang. And please feel free to say I recommended them. Oh, yeah, they, thanks, man. You, you came out of weird nowhere, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so this, so yeah, they're mostly women I'm thinking about here. That, That's good. Uh, can I, please yeah. uh, go. To no, them. thanks. You've been yeah. so generous with your time, Richard. And yeah, I'll get this out tomorrow. And it was so much fun. I mean, I, I definitely think uh, we can... You know, let me know about when the book's coming down the pipeline. We really would love to, yeah. uh, uh, Leah, to try would it jive be okay again. Ever, uh, I repost it also on my YouTube channel. I mean, I didn't launch launch it yet. Is that okay? You mean this episode? Yeah, you can. I'll uh, share it with you. Parts of it, just just the parts. Of, I mean, again, yeah. I put it of course. I'll, from I'll make you, it a I'll video. A yeah, yeah. Or you can share yeah, yeah. it on your Facebook, of course. Yeah, yeah be say, very happy yeah, to. I can do that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I still have to really go down give because I'm so busy with the writings and everything. Like that, but I really need to work on my. I didn't even finish monetizing it. I mean, it has like a few thousand followers. It's, it's decent, but I need to finish the monetization and I have to do my TikTok and all of that because elections yeah. is here in the Philippines. So and many TikTok's people are tick, pressuring yeah. me to go and do my stuff, podcast and all of, all, all of that, right? So yeah, I made, uh, and I'll ask your uh, advice just in case. No, I've I'm, just I'm, helped I'm, Mohammed Zishan, who's, uh, you know, he's also SCMP. And yeah, I just helped him set up his podcast like a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Please, so now maybe he's, I should he's, ask you. Yeah. yeah, like I'll 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 let you you know I, I've got to run and uh, get lunch and get stuff but ready no, with my kids. No, but in no, the we can have another talk. I'll let you yes, know please, about please. microphones, editing software, yeah. where you should host, uh, a bit about yeah. marketing strategy. You know, like setting expectations and and you know how to how yeah. to um sort of just get the first the ball rolling with like half a dozen episodes to begin with. That's always important to launch yeah. with several episodes. Yeah. There's just some, you know, some, some tricks and some sort of best practices that, that will keep you in good stead and stuff. And um, yeah, no, you'll be perfect. I work at in it. the You're media. I work in, I am active on social media. So I, I, I'm, I'm you get I'm, all I'm, that stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah it's yeah. just like that. Some of the technical stuff I have to yeah, just get, get, around. get levelator. That's a great plugin and yeah. you'll need VAC, which is virtual uh, audio cable, which costs about $30, but it's legacy software. It'll help you. Oh, but yeah, we, we, we can we can uh, I do, connect, um, yeah. connect. Oh, we got that yeah we got that covered you, you mean this yeah. one no it's not a physical like thing no, no oh no 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 virtual oh. audio cable so what oh, it does virtual. Is oh, it virtual. allows oh, yeah, yeah. me to record guests oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the recording vac yeah yeah, of yeah course. vac okay. this kind of stuff okay yeah, yeah. all right maybe sometime later on we when, can, when we can talk both our schedule stones down I, maybe yeah. I will need a, a free webinar <laughs> yeah, <laughs> orientation. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll give it, you all that just stuff. Just give me a few time, yeah, if I could yeah. set it up because I, I need to. Uh, 
and then I'll, I'll do, I have my own team and all production team I can deal with later. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. I just need to learn some stuff myself. I, I don't want to be dependent on other people. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, Thanks, Richard. Yeah. It's been an absolute pleasure. I, it's, yes, the listeners are going to love it. Thanks, buddy. Thanks so yeah, much. Please, we'll please talk again soon. Fantastic ladies. I, I will. I will. I'll <laughs> do that. Thank you. Thank God you. Bless. Okay. Take a, take a,